Okay, IRL, let's do this one last time. My name is Caitlin Kadju. I'm an illustrator and animator. And my name is Ira Marks. I write and draw comics. When we were young and oh so innocent, we got our fingers pinched by radioactive VHS copies of Disney's The Cobweb Hotel. And for our whole lives, we've had the uncanny ability to intensely emotionally bond with cartoons. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure you know the rest. Welcome to Cartoon Feelings. Okay, Caitlin. Ira. <laughs> I, I want to whisk you away Tinkerbell style to the best day of your life, December 14th, 2018. Oh, the last good day. So did you get to the theater on this day to see this movie or was it a, a slow build for you? Were you there in the moment? I mean, we all know this is your favorite movie of all time, so let's not. Well, it's the best movie bush. of all time too. So we can't just restrict it only to my conception. We have to externalize yeah, it to, in God's hall of movies. It is inscribed. There shall the be best no piece better of media. Um, it tops I, the uh, the Gutenberg Bible or, you know, the Ten Commandments. Any any other thing that's ever been made by mankind pales in comparison. Yeah, like they were all uh, stepping stones just to get here. And they serve no other larger purpose. Uh, True. So here we are, December 14th. I don't know if Back I... Back to the question. I, don't, I didn't see this on the day it came out, I don't believe, because I waited to uh, normally every year... Uh, my husband and I fly home to Oklahoma for Christmas, and I especially saved watching this movie so I could see it with my dad, who was always a big Spider-Man fan, uh, his favorite superhero as a kid, and I was very pumped to share this with him. Although I didn't know how good it was going to be, I just knew everybody else was talking about how freaking amazing it was, and you know what? They were right. <laughs> it is a great trailer. It's, it's a hype like trailer, a yeah. And it's also kind of a movie made to be a trailer in some ways. Yeah, because it's all hype. <laughs> it's all rise. It There's it's... no no not hype in it. <laughs> so, of course, it, it was topping the box office on that fateful day. But let's let's go through the other stuff that just was, you know, picking up the scraps. Let's see if you saw any of this stuff. No. <laughs> Mortal Engines, did you, are you, that could have been something, but I feel like it just didn't get off the ground. Yeah, I didn't see Mortal Engines. I'll be honest, didn't really see any of these, but we should still go through them. Uh, Mortal Engines, I agree with you based on what I know about it. And that was like a Peter Jackson project, wasn't it? Or like a big Weta workshop thing. Yeah. And I'm a yeah. sucker for a dumb premise like that. Like a premise that's just so wild, like... What is it? Like cities are mobile in this universe and they also like fight each other like Gundam style or something like they're like. Godzilla yeah, it's some towns. real high cons. Yeah, it's a book series. Yeah, it's cities, mobile cities that fight each other. A lot of green screen, I think, in this one. And I, I just don't think they really found likable characters for this adaptation. So just, you know. Did you and you had seen this? No, I'm not going to watch this You shit. didn't see this? Okay, guys, I w I'm curious what <laughs> people thought about it because when it came out, the advertisement looked very young adult in the way that like yeah. Hunger Games was or mm -hmm. uh, those like Divergent, whatever those were. Um, and that was like, that's weird. And I just kind of wondered if that was actually correct. Uh, I guess I, we will never I, know. No, yeah, let's keep talking about a movie we haven't seen. But on that point, that that flavor of young adult, it um I'm I'm not really into it. I've watched the Hunger Games movies. I didn't watch the Divergent stuff. And even the new Dune movie has a bit of that YA flavor for some reason. I guess it's just a safe space for a studio to um connect with adults and teens and possibly like mature children. You know what? And I'm going to go, I actually, 
I don't think the Dune movie does have that vibe, except for the... What is the name of the dude they cast as the main character? He's like this little shrimpy lad. Yeah, the call me by your name kid. That guy, like, is just the embodiment. Timothée Chalamet or whatever his name. I don't know how to pronounce it, I guess. But, um... I think T- Timothy Chalamet. He screams young adult energy. Like, he just has a young adult air. Like, I don't even... I don't know. I don't want to hate on this guy. He's really popular, apparently, but, like, I just don't... He was hands down the worst part of Little Women for me. Oh, wow. Yeah, I thought he was cute in that. I He's got him. other roles that I've liked him in. But uh, but the trailer for Dune opens with a kiss, which is, like, not really what that story is about to me. So that just struck me as, like, oh, wow, okay. Either this trailer is designed to rope in teens that don't care about this kind of cold sci-fi but but anyway mortal engines not a not for us Mm-mm. Mm-mm. but we did you and i saw ralph breaks the internet together no we didn't that's the second time that you've okay. thought that on this podcast though <laughs> i'm not gonna cut that out isn't it that's weird staying. though i don't know why but no we didn't i saw that on a plane actually i didn't see it uh in theaters and i thought it was really bad <laughs> yeah <laughs> really we, didn't care for it we at don't all. Need to- yeah, we spent too much time talking about lackluster animations. Let's move through this. Mm. Creed 2, I love uh, the first Creed. The second Creed is okay. Just totally not familiar with this franchise. I mean, obviously, I've heard of it. I just haven't seen any. Yeah. I never saw any of the Rocky movies. Like good... They're pretty fun. I would it's love a, it's a pretty to good watch. Ride. Yeah, I'm not. It's not by avoidance. Just we never watch Rocky. And like, it's one of those movies that I've always intended at some point to take the time to watch. Yeah, and it just never get on happened. the train some year. It's a good uh, winter watch because everybody's so sweaty in it. Oh, that sounds amazing. That's how I feel. Yeah. <laughs> now, Bohemian Rhapsody. What? Why did I? Something started to come together. Whenever I start typing movie titles in order, I just start to build this narrative. Now, Bohemian Rhapsody is not a very good movie. Sorry, Mom. I know you really enjoyed this one, but it's. It's uh, somehow it reminds me of this era of Marvel and Spider-Man stuff because there's a bit of the flavor of trying to redeem or not redeem. uh, What's the term I'm looking for? Are you sure it's not glamorized? I feel like that was on the tip of your tongue. I don't know, though. I don't know where you're going with this. Yeah. Fetishize? (laughs) No. What happened? What do you call it when somebody passes away and you want to like preserve their legacy? Yeah, I mean, this is one of those... Eulogize. (laughs) This movie is trying to preserve the legacy of a band in a way that is building a narrative and picking and choosing based on what they want to say and how they Mm. want the world to recall them. And there's a tiny aspect of Spider-Verse that's doing that as well that comes up right at the top. So we'll get there. So that, that was something that was popping into my mind when I was typing Bohemian Rhapsody. You'll you'll find out what I'm talking about. You might even be able to guess. Yeah, I got it. Doesn't really have anything to do with the movie. It's more like a title card in front of the movie. Didn't see Bohemian Rhapsody either. Just yeah, chiming in on that. I it's I don't I like mean, these types of movies for exactly the reason you describe. I'm like I'm not really interested in the fantasy story behind yeah. some real thing. Okay. Right. Okay. Some more Harry Potter. Fantastic Beasts and the Crimes of the Fantastic Beasts franchise. (laughs) And how they're not very good. This movie's got a colon in it. That's the Spider-Verse connection. Yeah. I mean, and that's where the similarities end. I don't know. I didn't see Crimes of Grindelwald, but I saw the first one and just, I was like, what? I don't know. I don't know what I was expecting. Not a fan of the Fantastic Beasts movies. Um, But it is really funny that uh, Autocorrect likes to make that fantastic breasts so i had a couple people tell me that they had just gotten Uh, back from seeing fantastic breasts (laughs) and i think more (laughs) that might actually be worth it (laughs) that might actually be why those movies exist so maybe it's fine i'd want to know what comes after the colon in that movie (laughs) that's like fresh crimes of griddle it's just the same that's what the magic is (laughs) Okay, so that that kind of wraps up the box office at this time. As usual, lots of sequels, lots of like 
flavors of things you're well, already familiar with. And let's just say, like, Mortal Engines, I feel like, was a wild stab, but it just didn't seem to amount to much. Yeah, they probably just played it too safe, which, you know, the reason we like the movie we're about to talk about is because it's very likable, but it's also challenging what you expect from an animated film or, you know, kind of a fantasy adventure with a sci-fi flavor, right? And a Spider-Man flavor, which was really challenging me because as we might get into a little bit, like, I don't, this may shock and surprise the audience that there's no affinity for Spider-Man in any capacity whatsoever. So for this to be one of my favorite movies in the universe, in the entire Spider-Verse is very bizarre, I guess. Like, I don't know. It's, it was totally unexpected to me. If you had told me that one of my favorite all-time movies was going to be a Spider-Man movie, I would have looked at you like you were losing it. Right. So if I get a time machine someday, my first... First thing on my to-do list is go back to young Caitlin and tell tell her that this Spider-Man movie will come out one day and you're, it's going to blow your mind. It's going to be your favorite thing. Please and you'll slap me. Don't go back to young Caitlin. She was not very cool. <laughs> don't hang out with younger <laughs> Caitlin. She doesn't know stuff. Okay, we'll stick with current current timeline. <laughs> I'm Caitlin. doing okay now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, as. As is the trend with all the movies we've talked about, Rotten Tomatoes loves it. Top of the charts. 97%, baby. Those 3%, mm, screwing around. Incorrect. Okay. <laughs> Wrong. Right. Who are those people? <laughs> it's some bot that was like misprogrammed or something. Yeah, I was just like, mm, room for error, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. And uh, it did. So... There were a ton of awards this movie won, left and right, all over the place, well-deserved. Uh, but it's notable for beating out, well, a bunch of movies, but specifically Incredibles 2. It beat out Incredibles 2 for the Oscar for Best Animated Film of 2018, which well, I thought my... was cool and good. No, very cool. Do you, I mean, the Oscars, who knows what they mean anymore, but in terms of animation in general do you think they know what they're talking about oh god no. way? absolutely okay, so not. It, and it kind of doesn't matter or so no it doesn't let me i'll expand on that a little bit but i want to say like one of the reasons i put this up is because specifically for the oscar for best animated film yes probably because nobody cares about animated film in terms of the oscars uh, but it's almost never not pixar almost never right. and i think it was like uh rango in 2011, I believe, also won. And that was like the only other time up till now that it wasn't just like Pixar, 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 Pixar. And it's just, it's the freaking Pixar award. And so anytime another movie kind of crosses the threshold of the zeitgeist or whatever, like people, general people who don't care about animation take note enough that another movie wins, I think that might be the only thing about the Oscars that is interesting to me. <laughs> Because that's a big deal. Like for people who are totally checked out and don't care and they're just going with Pixar for the brand recognition because their kids have seen it and they love it, whatever. You know, for something else to to come from behind. Especially like Sony Imageworks doesn't have as much of a – it's not like Disney. You know, right. people aren't necessarily thinking about that in the same way. So I think that is cool. But I yeah. will just like to say, yeah, the Oscars don't mean anything and are dumb. No, I mean, the only way they mean something is it, it does tend to affect what gets made a little bit, you know, like something, the prestige for the people in the industry does matter to them, even though it might not matter to us because we can, we can watch whatever we want when we want it. What we watch doesn't affect anybody's careers. Well, okay. never mind. That's stupid. Take it, take that out later. I Ira. think we can't get too far into the Oscar rabbit hole because- that's there's so much to say about it. Yeah. Okay. There's so much. Goodbye, Oscars. We'll never talk about you again. <laughs> you are not welcome here. But the one point I was trying to make when I <laughs> was trying to explain the Oscars, even though I don't know what I'm talking about, was Spider Verse is a bit of a critic proof movie in some ways. It's doing a lot of things exactly right to not uh, to just build this force field around itself. You know, like in a good that way, might, I think. 
Yeah, I think you might be right. There's more I want to say about this. I had I just got off the tail end of watching the director's commentary because I hadn't before, which is kind of surprising. I think I just forgot that those existed in the past couple years. Um, but just like the craftsmanship that went into this movie and like how much they cared and you have all of these like Hollywood kind of heavy hitters running it and the fact that they had three directors and then also at least one co-director maybe two they just had a ton of people Mm -hmm. running this train uh and also too if you have like um phil lord and chris miller involved in any kind of a way you're gonna make something that's awesome probably and i don't know i feel like those they have a lot of uh I don't know if they have, like, weight in Hollywood. I don't know. They just really know what they're doing. They really know movies. They've made names for themselves. Rightfully so. They know how to... There's just a lot of power behind this movie. When I, when I think of those two, what I think of... It's not the same way I think of, like, a Spielberg or a Catherine Bigelow or these people with, like, a, a an eye for cinema and like, uh, you know, they pick these projects to try to explore ideas they have about it. And they find these stories for the Lord and Miller. It's, it's like, they're trying to have a conversation with us and they're really good at getting people engaged and feeling good about what they're watching. If that makes sense. Like the Lego movies are extremely fun to watch and they have a really beefy, moral center that feels good it doesn't feel cheap and cheesy like it it feels authentic the stakes are also really low which to me often cheapens a movie but the way they do it it feels right like the stakes are not very high in spider-verse i don't feel but i still feel great about it and i do worry about the characters but i don't worry about them in the same way as i do in other types of stories like this doesn't feel like it fits in with like the marvel canon of you know that that universe yeah and i think like like phil lord and chris miller obviously have this really intense humorous flavor Mm -hmm. like you can frequently tell if it's a lord and miller project because it's very funny and because of the type of humor and it's like a little hard to describe what that is but also there's a lot of energy yeah like in the in the jump street movies things are just like happening and like everything is moving fast and like people are talking and it's happening fast, but it's also never confusing really. And it's never like stressful or weird. And I do agree that in all the stuff that I've seen uh, of theirs, it's the stakes are not very high either. A lot of it has kind of a, you know, I don't know, like the Jump Street movies are not family friendly, but they're not, it's just not, you know, dramatic. Yeah. There's not they're a good lot friend of movies. It's like a, a nice, but friendship. even, this is what I like about about Spider-Verse is, like, there are those moments. Like, there's not really a time where somebody dies in a way that I'm, like, oh, I'm, like, sobbing mm-hmm. personally. But there are sad emotional moments in Spider-Verse or, like, touching emotional moments between characters. And it's, like, they pay this really wonderful attention to the emotional moments. And um, I honestly would highly recommend watching the director's commentary if you hadn't first of all it's just really fun to listen to the three directors kind of just hang out and talk with each other it's really funny that they laugh at all the little funny jokes in the movie like they can't (laughs) help it they're not just dryly commenting but they're like huh like when something cute happens on screen i was like you just love this so much and that's so amazing and it shows but they were just like we agonized over the scene and it took forever and it had to be important and it had to matter and honestly too i was like well at least for me probably why this movie resonates so much is it is exactly it's made in exactly the way that I have said on the podcast that I think stories should be made Mm -hmm. or like the appropriate kind of approach and philosophy to storytelling is like they were trying to make sure every single second of this movie mattered and also had the right emotional impact and it made you feel right and like I think Peter Ramsey, one of the directors, went on a little tangent about how movies are emotion machines or like emotional machines because you have to get every little piece exactly right and you have to keep it oiled and like keep it maintained Mm -hmm. because if you don't do it, like something's going to get stuck in it and then you won't feel right. And I was like, that's actually really cool and it makes a lot of sense to me. Like that is how I feel about what makes a good movie a good movie 
is you actually you do have to care. You have to care about all that stuff. You have to cut out stuff that doesn't, you know, that gets in the way or that like kind of screws stuff up because you want people to emotionally connect. And you want it to make sense. So you can't just have characters doing stuff for no good reason. You have to feel like it matters. Yes. I trust these guys. I trust them. Yeah. No, I agree. And it's interesting the way it, it all came together to make this perfect formula. Because aside from the Lord and Miller, the directorial team doesn't really have a lot of credentials. So... Like, I guess, I, I don't know who is doing, who's, who does most of the talking on the commentary? Is there a voice that This is an unfortunate or? situation because I could not really tell their voices oh, okay. apart. <laughs> I'm sorry. It just, it was a lot of like crosstalk and stuff, which was great energy, but it's just hard. And you have that this many directors, so it's just like hard to parse. And I, I could, it helps when they called each other out by name. <laughs> But it was unclear. And honestly, it felt like all of them were very involved because they were frequently saying like, oh, this was something that like Bob Persichetti recommended. And this is why we put it in. And then, you know, some funny joke would happen and they would be like, oh, Rodney, you wanted to put that in here. And then, you know, I cut it out and then we ended up putting it back in and that was the right call. And it just felt it just felt very collaborative, which I also want to talk about the collaborative spirit of this movie. And I might leave it a little bit, but I love that there were three directors. Honestly, I think it did it so much credit. Mm -hmm. It's also such a weird thing. I just, I don't know. I want to get into that a little bit. Yeah, it seems like it could go wrong. Like off the bat, you don't, there's so many horror stories of like directors come in and go in on different projects. To hear that there's three directors on something doesn't usually just makes you kind of nervous. But yes, yeah, so there's some magic behind the scenes of staying organized. And I guess that's part of being good at animation and part of the draw for you and I is it's extremely organized to even be half as good as it ever is. Like it's so easy for the stuff to fall apart, right? Yeah. You have to keep on top of it or it's just not happening. Uh, and yeah, I'd love to know their magic sauce to just have this team where they all seem to just vibe and get along and have a unified vision. And honestly, and that gets to my whole like chip on my shoulder about auteur ship or whatever in cinema and this is like such a fantasy to me about how movies could be made i'm like why don't we all just be collaborative and consider this a team effort and uh on the commentary as well i noticed that they spent a lot of time specifically talking about the team and all of the departments and how much work they had put in and calling out people by name and like their contributions and i just like I you know that's not unheard of i've seen people do that before obviously but it's so nice to see that it's so nice to see when people are like, this movie's awesome because we had a bunch of awesome people working on it and they all worked really hard mm -hmm. and we all worked together. And it's like, there's not enough of that energy in the world. So I thank you. I was looking into Peter Ramsey a little bit because he's just one of the main voices on this movie that pops up a lot, you know, as like the first black director to get nominated for an Academy Award. And we can get into that a little bit, but I was noticing back in the day, he was a storyboard artist on a lot of stuff, which being good at storyboarding is probably one of those things that lends itself to just being a great team player. Cause you, you're kind of in the middle of a process handing, you're absorbing information on one side and then filtering it and transferring it to somebody else. You're not like the top of the heap. And, uh, he did some storyboard work on tank girl, which is a comic book I was all about in the mid nineties. It's probably like one of the most influential things in my life. And they made a live action movie of it and it has an animated segment right at the end. And this all ties together because when I watch spider verse, it has the energy that I would have wanted from a true tank girl animation. It's like, it's just punk is the only way I can describe it. It's just mashing together a bunch of like corners of culture and it's just got this unbridled energy, which is exactly what Spider-Verse is. So I like that this guy appeared back in the day uh, to work on Tank Girl. And there's there's just there must just be an energy that he has that um, he brought to that movie or built up in that movie and then brought to this thing all these years later. Yeah, you cut your teeth on all this stuff. Yeah. Do you know what Tank Girl is? I know of it. I don't have I've never seen it or. It's like I've encountered a lot of people who love Tank Girl, but I've never experienced any of it in any form. Okay. I feel like it's it's up your alley. It's, but if you... 
If you have any recommendations, I am happy to take. Yeah, a look. well, it's Jamie Hew Hewlett who went on to do Gorillas, so it's like oh. that that art style. That's he, wow. Tim Curl is his first thing. That's wild. Yeah, his comic books Ugh. like read like a music video. They they're extremely vulgar and loud and nonsensical in a lot of ways, but it. <laughs> Right up my but alley. it's it's got some <laughs> Spider Verse energy for sure. And then uh, that's awesome. So Peter Ramsey did Rise of the Guardians also, which it this is where I get confused because I never saw that movie. I had no interest in seeing it, and I need to know from you, like, where does the look of Spider Verse originate? Like, where does this all come from? Because <laughs> it doesn't seem like to in be the him. context of like visually, like just this whole idea of let's make this feel like a comic book. Like, who headed that up? Um, honestly, I don't know that it came from any of them individually. I think it was because it is what was expected of the project or not that, but it's like what the project demands in a way. Mm. And if you want to make it that way. And, um, I don't know how much we can attribute it to any, I, cause uh, this is all speculation. I haven't heard any one person come forth and be like, I decided, you know, it would, should be very colorful and like have a, like half tone and stuff like mm -hmm. that. But, like, the Lord and Miller aesthetic, I think, like, it's something that I could easily see them kind of pivoting into. Right, after Lego It's movie. not at all the same, but if you've seen Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, which is their first, I think that might even be their first movie that they did. Uh, but it was their first animated movie. It was also a Sony movie. Uh, and no, it doesn't look anything like a comic book, but it's just weird and, like, colorful and, like, wild stuff is happening. And I think they are just want to, they'll take any aesthetic and run with it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, you know, I think just since all of, there's so much comic bookiness to this story, like not even just, oh, it's a comic book story, but it's also like a bunch of different comics right. <laughs> put together into one universe story. I think it all just kind of come, like comes from that. Before we get too far down the line of like uh, the kind of the making of and then into sort of the story. I just wanted to go back and talk about the Spider-Man-ness of it. So here's the the one thing that bothered me about this movie, and it's such a petty little thing. When the movie starts... I won't have it. <laughs> when the movie starts, you get the Stan Lee uh, tribute card, which, you know, because he had just passed away when this came out. So it does make sense. But in the theater, everybody's like, Oh, and, you know, if you're related to Stan Lee, I feel bad for you. Uh, you know, rest in peace, Stan Lee. I'm not trying to badmouth a person who lived a life and had people that cared about him. But I'm, I feel like this movie is all about people working together and how there's a lot of voices in the room on all levels, creatively in the story of the movie. And the whole Stan Lee narrative is him standing on top of people like Jack Kirby or Steve Ditko, who is the other half of creating Spider-Man. And it's probably the main reason Spider-Man is even like an icon because he's the artist. Steve Ditko is like the artist who defined him, not Stan Lee. So that always, that I remember sitting in that theater and watching the Stan Lee name just pop up on the screen and being like, we're just going to canonize Stan Lee in front of this movie and just you know, make him the, the Shakespeare of like the whole Marvel universe when especially this movie, Spider-Verse, just isn't really about that. So that that's like my little <laughs> thing with this movie. Yeah. And it's just political. It's I mean, it's a studio choice, I'm sure. But Well, and it's like this movie does have some kind of ties to the Marvel universe, which is obviously very invested in Stan Lee. And like he's had the cameos in every single MCU movie, that kind of a deal. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if it had something to do with that. Yeah. it's. A I don't know exactly where the connection is, but there is some kind of connection between this movie and the MCU people. Uh, so I don't know. And just as like an outside... Well, it's not even a take. It's just like I can't really speak to it because I was never a comics person. And my dad, when he was younger, was. He loved Spider-Man when he was a kid. But it was just one of those things that, like, unlike movies and, like, the movies that he loved, he didn't really share a lot of comic stuff with us. And I think he just didn't have any, mm -hmm. really. So it just wasn't a thing. And so I really haven't read a lot of comics. And I don't have a lot of familiarity so, like, I know who Jack Kirby is and, like, I know his art. You know, I'm familiar with, like, some of the more more obvious, like, well-known names. 
But like, I have no idea what Stanley did or didn't do. Actually, the most familiarity I have with Stanley as an individual is that I watched his, I don't know if anyone in the audience will remember this, but Stanley had a reality show in the mid 2000s uh, called Who Wants to Be a Superhero? Right. <laughs> and it was people dressed up in superhero costumes pretending to do superhero stuff. And yeah, I definitely watched it. It was really dumb. Um, but that's it. And so I've always known kind of Stanley like post post his legacy. Yeah. Like whatever that is. And like kids today who are probably watching MCU movies know him as the guy who shows up in all the MCU movies and nothing more. Right. Yeah. So it's kind of weird because yeah, it is weird. Like I've always known him as his reputation just vastly precedes him. And therefore I don't know him at all. I think as someone, I, I, I get a little sensitive about it because the superhero side of comics is not my comics world. Like I had, I had Marvel books. I had a lot of X-Men, but they're the weird X-Men. They're like Chris Claremont X-Men about identity and, and like the, the underserved people in the world. And that's like what those stories are about. And you know, Spider-Man and stuff like that is for a different time period. And then that's where we get into this sort of like Incredibles thing where it's like we're recalling the 60s-ness of it all with some of these characters. And they're in a lot of ways stuck there. Like the original Spider-Man is stuck in the 60s, no matter what you want to do with him. He's always going to play to the tropes of that time. And that's why you need a Miles Morales to to reboot it, because he in a lot of ways is he's not the Spider-Man that we grew up with. He's like a creation from Obama era where like two artists come together. Yeah. Brian Michael Bendis and this Italian artist who I'm not too familiar with, Sarah Pacelli. And they just wanted to create a new version of Spider-Man that isn't bogged down by the like roll your eyes at it, like uh origin story that the movie even kind of played. Well, actually this doesn't, necessarily come in in the movie but people at the time this movie came out everybody's like so done with the spider-man origin story but if you want to oh, i feel like that comes up a lot in the movie well it comes up and that they're telling you it's like not as relevant as it once was right no i totally disagree i don't know like because they do an origin story for literally every single spider-verse character that shows but, up to the point that they're being very tongue in cheek about it. And I think they are saying, no, it doesn't matter. But I think that's like, they don't, they run at it kind of aggressively is what I'm saying. Like they don't sort of like just back burner it. They're like, for real though, we're going to yell very loudly about how origin story is very played out. Like they're drawing a lot of attention to it. Yeah. But the, well, I just mean the specific origin story of the, with great power comes great responsibility is not really, that's not the Miles Morales backstory no, yeah it's kind of he's like a rejection of that yeah he's he's in a way right well like in the in the books he is it, it's actually a little darker which i the, the movie doesn't quite get into and i'm just kind of bringing it up because it's to me it's interesting what they adapt and what they choose not to adapt for just the strategy of how to make you know an all ages cartoon so in the book he is the son of jefferson and the nephew of aaron and jefferson and aaron have like a criminal history and Aaron goes the way of the career criminal and Jefferson makes the choice to like play the side of good. And in the books, Miles is more conflicted with the, the draw of the criminal side. And it's like this whole like hardwired DNA thing, which is kind of like connected to, you know, the Spider-Man like lore. It's like, well, how can, how can you deny these things that are built into you? And that's just kind of that extra little level that I think it, it makes Miles unique. And the story in the Spider-Verse doesn't quite get there because he never has that conflict other than the reveal that his you know, uncle is a criminal and him having to deal with that. Yeah, that is super interesting because it's like it doesn't bother me at all that it doesn't go there in when I'm sitting there watching the movie. But in hindsight, kind of, I'm like, why does Aaron turn out the way that like it's satisfying to me that they don't explore it because it's easy to ruin it yeah. if you pick at it too much but it does you sit there with those questions and you're like why is he this criminal guy that like i guess would kill a kid yeah. <laughs> that he didn't realize you know and it's like how did, and how could he uh, he's just such an interesting character but yeah the, it's not explored and you do wonder 
what exactly is going on here? What exactly happened? Yeah. So just sort of, yeah, I had read a couple of these books and then just sort of looking back, I'm, I, I just wanted to really place in my mind who Miles Morales is as a, a creation of two comic artists. Because uh, as I was trying to get at before, like comics to me, it's not about following like a superhero story. The books I read were like usually creator owned. Like I read a lot of like Todd McFarlane image books and those all the image books at the time when I was growing up were creator owned. They had one artist, maybe a writer here and there, but it was usually like one name and one character and they did the whole thing. So to me, comics are that it's like a kind of a pure interpretation of like a, a creative vision unhindered by studio systems and all this stuff. So when I like a superhero movie, it's because they're finding that spirit of identity. And to me, that's why I really applaud this movie and why it's kind of critic proof in the way I was getting at. It's because it really is about identity. Like that's what this movie is about, like making a choice and like being somebody and like standing up for that person you want to be. And that's always going to win. Like if you can tell that story, like you, you won, you won your movie. You've done it. <laughs> I do agree. Yeah. So that, that's sort of like at the, the core of, of this to me, all, all the other stuff we love about this is like the flavor on top. But when I sit back and think about like what makes this movie great, it's like, oh, they really get the, the teenness of Spider-Man, which is like essential. Like you can't have Spider-Man be too old if you want to do a Spider-Man story because he is the first teenage superhero and he has like, he likes a girl and he's trying to like do his schoolwork, but he also has to be a hero. He's like juggling all this shit and just a lot of other superheroes don't do this. They don't make time. Yeah. For it. Even in the Incredibles, That's the characters are young. They don't do deal with the. Uh... Right. They totally ignore it. And like, I don't know, just throwing out like as a kid, I always liked Batman. Like I loved all the like old, you know, weird Batman movies and stuff like that. But like, Batman is not relatable, <laughs> like right. in any sense of the word. And like probably what appeals about Spider-Man, and I say this as somebody who doesn't know a lot about other Spider-Men, but definitely what appeals about Miles is like he's so relatable and not even just like, oh, I feel those feelings. We've all been like stressed at school and like awkward teens or whatever, but just like you see that and you're like human being, real person. Yeah. And, you know, if you see like the billionaire superhero or whatever that just – I don't, let's not even get into Batman, but like, that's just a car, like a cartoon character. I, actually, like he's the cartoon character mm -hmm. and Miles Morales and Spider-Man is like a real person. Yeah. And it feels contemporary, right? This really felt like being in the moment at the time uh, and not to jump back to the Incredibles, but that seemed to be one of our main problems with the Incredibles is it did not want to f face the current times. <laughs> Whereas this one does. Yeah. Yeah, this felt, yeah, it's just like, I don't know, it's very much about people and emotion. It's so obvious how much Spider-Verse is about how people relate to each other and how they work together. And those are good feelings to have in this day and age. And they're good problems to talk about. And it's really hard, I guess, to make a movie that's about, you know, people emotionally connecting and relating and working together and like not have people respond so you did it really well. And so the response was universally positive, so, you know, but if you're genuinely touching people then we're going to love it. Yeah. Yeah. Make that extra effort. So th that said, just a note that you've got here in the document about this alternate cut and a, the idea of a very different story, which to me blows my mind because I, I don't really see any room for, <laughs> you know, the story is so good. I don't it's see a different version. So can you wild. tell us a little about this very different story. So, yeah. And if you have this on Blu-ray or there are certain digital copies you can buy that have special features and it should come with that. And it really is truly just a full movie that is the same movie, but totally different. And it's totally wild. Uh, it's been a while since I've watched it and I only watched it through once. But the, the biggest difference is that, so in the original cut, um, the theatrical cut of Spider-Verse, uh, Miles has this roommate at the Brooklyn Visions Academy or whatever, and his name is Genki. I don't even know if they say that in the movie. He's barely in it. I don't think he even has a line. But in the 
I think this character was in the comics. That is what I'm given to understand. I don't uh, yes. Ira's nodding at me, yeah. so <laughs> um he was going to play a much larger role in the movie, and he's like the kind of supporting character. He's in every scene, he's Miles' best friend. He's constantly talking to him about stuff. And, like, Miles doesn't want to do the Spider-Man stuff, like, doesn't want to do the Spider-Verse stuff. And Genki's like, no, it's awesome. Like, you have to do this. And if I remember correctly, they watch, like, a Spider-Man movie. They, like, go see Spider-Man the motion picture (laughs) and then, like, try to enact some of that, like, trying to figure this out. And it's so weird. It's so different. And it's really cool because there are interesting scenes that supplement the original movie in ways it truly does i'm so glad they did this because it really does just feel like this weird glimpse into an old version of this movie like there's one scene where he just has this emotional sort of heart to heart with peter b parker and i honestly can't even remember really what they're talking about but they're just like sitting together i think like looking out at the city and just talking and peter b parker you know says some kind of emotional stuff about his relationship with mary jane and just like stuff that is hinted at you really do feel like you're getting this other glimpse of maybe like things that he could have been thinking and feeling at the time, but just weren't in the actual movie. Yeah. It's so cool that they did it. And yeah, like a lot of it is unfinished. Um, But I would highly recommend checking it out if you love this movie, because it's really cool. And there's so much extra stuff. You know, if you like to claw out all the extra juice like I do, you know, there's a lot. Oh, and uh, I did want to mention this too, which I had left a note here about uh, another special feature thing that they did, which... If you watch the alternate universe cut of the movie, it's at the start of it. They they play it at the start. And they made this little like Looney Tunes animation mm-hmm. with Spider-Ham. And it's just great. I, that's all I have to say about it. You should go look at it. It's kind of like Looney Tunes vibes with a little bit of like that like Dexter's Lab or like Powerpuff Girls mm-hmm. era of animation. And it's just cute. And I think it's great that they did it. And it's little things like that where I'm just like. You guys love this stuff so much. You just love making things and like making and just and like who even knows like this wasn't in the theater. As far as I recall, this was not in the theatrical. Yeah. I don't think it was. Just the fact that it exists. I'm just like, like what a wonderful y'all are great. So I would. Yeah. You know, if you're going to take an evening to revisit this movie or maybe you've watched it one too many times, like such as myself. (laughs) Try the all, try the all universe mode. It's cool. The what I heard with the the uh, roommate scene and that, um, you know, once you watch this, that makes a lot of sense because it is funny that they did the right thing with it. They did have to cut out every aspect of that character other than just having them in the room for it to work. Otherwise, you would be questioning why aren't we getting more of this character? But I heard it was because the Tom Holland Spider Man they created a character out of the blue that basically is that role. It's like the friend who's following him through the story of like how to become Spider-Man. And he's kind of like bouncing ideas off him and helping him get perspective. So, you know, I guess this movie could have done that because I guess it it would have tied, it makes sense because it would have tied miles more to the schoolness of it because he doesn't really spend a lot of time with the community of his school other than Gwen, but she's not really a student there technically. So, um, but also I don't see how there was room for that extra character in this movie. There's so many fucking characters. Yeah, there totally wasn't. Uh, So (laughs) So it worked out. Yeah. I guess that. I'm not complaining about what we got. No. Y'all nailed it. They strategically uh, just eradicated that from the storyline and there's no evidence of it being a problem, which, you know, is another cool thing to point out because that sort of problem solving is that extra level of like creative process that you just don't get to see because if it's done right, there's no evidence of it going wrong. So maybe that was an awful time in their process where they're like, oh my God, this other movie is doing exactly what we're doing in this specific yeah. case. We have to cut this out. And I like that they did instead of just leaving it because it could have they could have been redundant, I guess, but it's nice that they're not. Yeah. <laughs> when it's so cool just because like they still got a whole movie out of it. Yeah. Sort of. It's not exactly the same, but like that's that's wild. And again, it's all these we talked um, we were talking about Pixar, about how many times they scrap a movie and like, you know, do it again. And like how many iterations of the story process they go through. But we don't get to see a lot of it. Sometimes we do. Mm -hmm. But most of the time you hear about it in an anecdote and that's it. 
And it's like months and months of work a lot of the time. I love that we get to see it in this case. Like if you want to, you can see this whole other track that they went down yeah. before they had to be or chose to pull back and just like totally eliminate that. That is real process stuff right there. I think that's really cool. And the fact that they have all this extra stuff, like it's sort of, <laughs> there's so many echoes of creative process happening in this movie. Like not only the way it looks and the way it evokes comics, the influence for this sort of storytelling and the influence for like so many types of movies we get, but also the whole process that they're going through is championing the idea that there's iterations of every story that we want to tell. Like the Spider-Man story can be told a million different ways if you put it in the hands of different people. And the fact that they take the time to do another cut of a movie just shows you that what they're saying to their audience is like, there's different ways to tell all these stories. Like it doesn't have to be the same people doing the same shit every time. And you should not be satisfied with that because watch, we can make two different movies out of this one movie you thought you you knew so well here's the alternative version so yeah i just think that's really cool because i to me and probably young artists that are absorbing all this stuff it's like just showing you that there's more options and there's more like questions you can ask when you get into a creative process hell yeah <laughs> oh also i just like totally agree <laughs> also i had some spider ham comics when i was a kid too they were awesome I love that so much. I didn't, I never heard of him before. Of course, I'd never heard of him before this. Yeah. Um, but I honestly didn't realize he was a real dude. Like, he was like a real, which is so cool. Yeah. To no, have found he's out. real. I don't, I don't, I actually don't know if like the Nick, the Nick Cage, uh, the noir, the noir like Spider Man. Yeah, yeah. Or like the anime character. What's her name? Penny, Penny? Parker is real. Okay. Yeah. The, I mean, maybe the they're all real. They're probably real. all real. So, yeah. The only one I know. I don't think Noir Spider-Man, does he get a name? I don't think so. Be beyond, so that's why I'm not 100% sure if he's legit or not. Uh -huh. But I do know Penny Parker had, so, oh, Spider-Man Noir is a fictional superhero appearing in American comic books published by Marvel Comics. Thank you, Google. Congrats, Marvel. So this is real. Don't at us. <laughs> we just, I just don't know that much about this. Um, honestly, though, I just love that so mm -hmm. much because it does... I was fully willing to believe they were all fabrications of the movie and something about them all being real just makes it that much cooler. Yeah, because they're all speaking to different comic genres. Like Spider-Ham is that let's take the thing and um, age it down so like younger kids can introduce themselves in the same way you get really cute cartoony like Star Wars shorts on YouTube because it's just trying to like build this new audience from the ground up of a younger, not to be cynical about it. But I think Spider-Ham was probably part of that marketing strategy. It's like, let's make something goofy that looks a little like Garfield, a little like Walt Kelly Pogo, and just bring in kids that might not be ready for the actual Spider-Man yet. But the the art was great. I, it was super cartoony, and um, it just had this great like brush style that um, just reminded me of Looney Tunes stuff. But you didn't... Yeah, I was going to say, it looks like somebody was just trying to get the Looney Tunes audience, yeah. which, yeah, is probably kids, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it really does. Yeah, it's just like Spider-Man by way of gag comics, and it's it's very good, because it doesn't probably, promise to be anything else. <laughs> that should have been my entry point, I think, into, Spider -Man. into the comics <laughs> universe. That would have that would have grabbed me. Yeah. So uh, before we get too deep into the story, I just... I thought we would talk a little bit about just kind of like the aesthetic stuff. And like, uh, I guess maybe you don't have the emotional connection to this. I do other than you love this movie and that's a, a very high emotion, but just seeing uh, like comic text and like speech bubbles on the screen was, I don't know. That was just kind of a big deal because the language of comics is very important to me in my life and career and all, all aspects of myself. And uh, I just like that they took the time to do that. It kind of adds, obviously it adds the like, this is a comic element, but it's just a great way to kind of do a gag or just give the movie a little flavor without kind of taking away from the story. Yeah, I. Uh, you're totally right when you say... Like, I don't have that innate connection to it. But there is something about visually that I just like, 
I just can't handle this movie, but in like the best way, yeah. right? Like, and uh, I didn't realize actually, I learned a lot from this director's commentary, y'all, uh, that there are, you know, any time where there's kind of like this big like smoke explosions and they're kind of this like cell animated clouds and then they have like the onomatopoeia like bam or like whatever happening, that a lot of the time that was... 3D, and so those were, like, fully dimensional elements that they had incorporated in there, too. But then they also have a lot of times where, uh, for a few frames or, like, for an effect that's happening, it's, like, all 2D and hand-drawn. And I'm just, like, sweating watching this movie, <laughs> just being, like, everything is moving, everything is colorful, and yet it is not hard to tell what's going on or to focus on the action. It's just, like, how did you do this? I've never been so crippled <laughs> by a movie in this way before, just, like... Uh, they frame a. I don't. You can you can feel the comic framing style, like a lot of um shots of like an establishing shot of like Miles coming out of the house, cut to the street. It's very uh linear, where everything's kind of like parallel to the frame. That that stuff to me is very comic-y, Just using rulers to to grid out a space and then designing over the top of that. And this movie is all levels like taking from comic page layout. And I think that's what helps it in a lot of ways. It's not using like camera angles in the way, like for example, Tintin, the Spielberg Tintin is great, but the camera is all over the place doing magical things. And it's doing that here. But when we're just following like somebody down the street or we're watching somebody swing by, sometimes they just do it as like a, it just pans right across a, the screen and the camera is totally still. And I think just taking those breaks really helps you soak in what's going on and makes you more hyped for when like the action gets wild again. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you point out the camera thing because I have noticed and I've heard people say uh, that, you know, when you get these like fully realized 3D environments and you kind of get access to technology that can really just let you go totally intense with it without any pushback, people will, yeah, they'll take a camera and they'll fly it around. It'll be doing all kinds of wild stuff. And then it ends up looking weird yeah. because presumably you as a human person know a camera can't do that and and subconsciously i guess because i don't know how much this is true or not but it definitely feels weird and i think that part is true i guess subconsciously you can sort of feel uh, this is fake right. because a person didn't do this even with the known camera technology we have like the in like the hobbit movie when they're like getting chased by the dragon and that camera is just going all over <laughs> everywhere and you're like it feels like a six flags ride actually it doesn't feel like I'm watching a movie. It's like a little too much. And in this movie, I would say the cameras are possibly behaving similarly to that. Mm -hmm. But because it's all framed in the language of comics, it doesn't matter. Because that's stuff that you see in comics. Yeah. And, and it's not, they're not using it in the way where they're just like, well, the camera can go anywhere because it's a 3D world. So let's just like do anything. Mm -hmm. They don't. They actually are very intentional with it. Mm -hmm. And, um... This isn't, you know, camera related, but I love that they use comic paneling in A, a bunch of different cool ways and B, really selectively so that you don't feel like this movie at any point is really like beating you over the head with like, oh, they're all in comic panels. Like they don't, but they use it at exactly the right time. So there's like the extended sequence halfway through when they're going to bust into the, um, God, is Alchemax? But the lab where uh, Doc Ock mm -hmm. is and like you're going to steal that computer. And there's this whole comic sequence about Peter B. Parker talking about how he's going to go in there and get a bagel and all this stuff. And it's all in like comic pages. And that that language shows up a few times during the movie, but it's never too much. Right. Uh, and it's just like it's so efficiently used and it gives you a break and it keeps the energy up and it's just so delightful. And then they use it in other ways where when Miles gets bitten by the spider and he's at school and he's freaking out and he's like sweating and being weird. And then all the panels start to go really crazy. They don't take you into an actual comic book with the pages turning, but they just start, you know, really hitting on that idea that everyone's looking at you and laughing at you by just surrounding you with like eyes and like people laughing and it's just covering the screen and it like heightens the tension. And it's just so brilliant. It's just such an effective use of that imagery to convey a particular feeling. Yeah. That I'm just like, I don't know how you nailed this so hard. Yeah. 
but I love it. Thank you. Not to get too philosophical with like the idea of comics and panels, but I definitely think about it a lot because I draw a lot of comic panels, but that doesn't, you know, <laughs> the, there's no way. What, to me, what a comic panel evokes, just the literal frame of something is it's an invitation to engagement from the reader. Because if you're reading a comic, you have panels, it's a series of images with gaps, and there is no other way for you to engage with that story than make up what's between those images and truly participate in the storytelling. So to me in the movie, when it's showing you a panel like that, it's almost like, oh, we're all reading this together. Like us, the filmmakers, we're all kind of like participating in this because, hey, we know what comics are. We have some comics. Here's a comic up on the screen. We're showing it to you. We're telling you and we're like giving you glimpses of all these different styles of art and like all these journeys of these different characters. We're hopping in and out and we're getting little tastes of like all these little worlds that come from the creative voice of a comic creator. So I don't know. There's just like so many layers of of uh, glimpsing at. <laughs> I don't know what Peeping. I'm talking about. It's hard to if say. You will. It's hard to say stuff when you just really appreciate and like something. <laughs> That's what. Yeah, I was like, I was kind of joking in previous episodes when I was like, oh, I can't wait to do the Spider Verse episode, or like you know, episode where I'm just gonna gush the entire time. But like, hello, welcome to the Spider Verse episode where I'm just gonna gush the entire time. <laughs> Try real hard to poke some holes, but. I mean, if nothing else, I'm glad we're talking about this because I personally, at least, want to hold this up as, like, truly being kind of the pinnacle of where my head is at in terms of storytelling and, like, visual storytelling and feature animation. Mm -hmm. I just, like, yeah, there's there's stuff that's wrong with this movie, maybe. I don't know. (laughs) But, like, it's just... It was one of those movies that, like, it's almost upsetting because I just look at it and I'm like, I will never make this. And whether that's true or not remains to be seen. But it just sets the bar so high. And I'm like, oh, like, I and I don't want to idolize anything. But it's really hard not to put this up on a pedestal in a way. Yeah. It, it's just so good. It's hard to imagine how something got to be, uh, I don't know, I'll go back to that critic proof idea and how this just... It, it's just so pure of heart in a way, which is something you don't imagine ever making it through a studio system. Because even some of the good Spider-Man movies always have something that if I'm going to talk, put them in the conversation with all other film makes them suck. Like, I don't think there's any good Spider-Man movies, really. Like something that stands up to a true film. None of the Spider-Man movies do that, except this one, because of what it sets out to do. Like, yeah, it's a cartoon. Yeah, it's like kid friendly. Anybody of any age can watch it. It's not dealing with like heavy, heavy adult stuff. But I think it stands up to any film because it fulfills the promise of what it sets out to do, which is like give you a high flying adventure with a lot of heart and like characters you want to just follow forever, which is very comic booky. Like you want more Spider-Verse movies. Because like there's so, this is just the tip of the iceberg, obviously, which the whole movie is like hinting at. Like there's so much more is what this movie is saying a lot of the time. Yeah. So we talked about, I don't remember what episode it was in. One of the Pixar episodes when you're talking about not really being able to just get lost in a movie anymore, especially animated movies, how we're always going to be kind of you know, thinking about how it was made and what are the choices and like da 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 da. And I will say the first time I watched this movie, no. I was just in it. And I also love the characters in a way that I didn't think was possible as an adult anymore. And this is kind of funny, but actually maybe I'll post some of these on our Instagram. But like I was Spider Woman. I was Gwen Stacy from this movie for Halloween this year. <laughs> yeah. Which is like, what? Again, like, if you had told me I was going to be a spider person for Halloween, I would have been like, what are you talking about? But I just loved her so much. I thought she was so cool. And then Neil did a spot on Peter B. Parker. He did. And we looked really cool. And I'm very pleased. Because we also don't do much for Halloween. But I was, like, legit moved in a way that, like, kids are. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, it was... Yeah, there's something about this movie is so powerful. It almost extracts Spider-Man from Marvel. Like when I think of this movie, I do not think about Marvel 
at all. Like what, you know, I don't think about the Marvel Cinematic Universe. This movie doesn't make me feel like those movies make me feel. They're just like two separate things. And they were able to just take the Spider-Man logo and just sort of remix it in a way where it does. It feels like it's there for everyone. It doesn't feel like an exclusive club, which comic books were for so long. Like part of the draw is if you're in the know, it's because you read all these issues. Like that's why it's like the core of like nerd culture, this like getting deep into the backstory to stuff. But this movie, you don't need to do any of that to like it. So you can, you can love Gwen because you just love this version of her in this movie. And that's totally fine. And I think that was probably really hard to do to just pull this away from the burden of Marvel universe building. Yeah. Yeah. It does feel very unique and you're right. I mean, every, we've all seen a million Spider-Man movies and this doesn't, I don't know. It does. I'm sure it does feel like a Spider-Man movie. Cause I just don't have that knowledge of like all of the fandom and the history and everything. Like I don't have it at all. So I can't speak to it. But when I watch this, I'm not like another spider. It feels like this just, could have come into the world on its own, even if Spider-Man didn't exist. Yeah, yeah totally. Which I mean in, like, the highest compliment. Because I bet, you know, diehard Spider-Man fans probably feel like there's an essence of Spider-Man in it. Um, mm -hmm. But I just was like, this feels fresh to me <laughs> in a way that also is very hard to conceive of when you're talking about superhero movies. Yeah, it's but it's weird because the opposite is also true. Like, it's not a Spider-Man movie, but... To remove, you would have to replace some of the iconography that they're remixing because it is a movie about remixing ideas. Like you need to know that there is a Spider-Man for everything else to orbit around it and fly off or replace or like all whatever it's doing with it. You know what I mean? Well, like you, I think that's what's so funny about yeah. it is, yeah, like it can't exist on its own. No. I mean, it's literally taking like a bunch of Spider-Mans that existed and putting them all in the same world and mashing it up, they're doing the ultimate unfresh thing. Right. So I think for it to come out feeling so original is just incredible. It just doesn't feel like, hey, remember this guy? Remember that Spider-Man? Even when they do it, they take a couple of little references to the Sam Raimi Spider-Man yeah. movies. They sort of remake at the beginning with like the perfect Peter Parker uh, they, they do the little, like him and Mary Jane in the cafe. And then Dr. Octopus like throws a car through the window, mm -hmm. like from the Spider-Man two. And then obviously they, they do a little nod to the Spider-Man dances on the street. And it's like very uncomfortable for everyone. <laughs> yeah. Like even when they include stuff like that, it doesn't feel tired. It feels like exactly the right amount of referencing. Yeah. And they're not really, and then they move on. They're not really making fun of it either. They're just acknowledging they're not. it's part of the journey. Like. You know, every everything you do to try to like understand yourself, you you kind of have to look back and laugh at some point because you can't just be burdened by like the mistakes you make. It seems to almost be saying. Yeah. <laughs> In a way, I think that's a love. It's a loving gesture because they are saying every Spider-Man is valid. Even these. Yeah. Hello. This has real and part of Spider-Man. Well, it, and it's all good and it's all fine. And I love In that. the sequel, I heard, you know, Tobey Maguire as a voice is coming back. So, I mean, they're... Really? Oh, yeah, I did yeah, hear about that. the journey's that. not over. I mean, they're definitely going to be pulling from those movies in some way or other, unless it's just a, as a, another joke. But they already did the joke, so I don't know. They must be taking it more seriously. Maybe. There's only one way to find out, and I just, I don't know, I'm nervous, but I'm excited. Uh, yeah, I mean, we got I a guess. bit of a wait. I, I think this movie is like one of those... Uh, What's the term for it? Magic in a bottle? Like it captures something. Like lightning yeah, in a bottle. Yeah, yeah. It, it's got to be that to some degree, which is kind of bittersweet because I can't imagine a sequel is going to live up to the magic of encountering this sort of thing for the first time because yeah. it, it seems so out of nowhere. I do agree. And how can you? And no matter how I feel about it, like this movie caught me by surprise. I went in thinking it was going to be a really cool movie aesthetically i did not expect to fall deeply in love with it at all mm -hmm. i didn't see it coming and you can't when that happens you can't see it coming you don't see it coming you're just stricken by it and the anticipation maybe even adds a little to it i i'm fairly confident that the sequel will be good oh yeah i'm fairly confident that it'll be really good but i'm not 
I don't know if I can divorce the feeling, like how much love and affection I have for this movie. Like, am I going to inherently be set down kind of by the sequel? I don't know. Cause I want to just go in being like, you just got to let it be its own thing, but you can't really as much as you'd like to. Yeah. It's impossible. You can't like wash away the memory of the first one to, to let the, yeah. so we'll, we'll just have to see, but I will say this is a team that I trust in a way that I don't trust anyone creatively probably so in a way before we get into the plot i'd like to acknowledge that you are a straight up spider-man fan now because like the way you talk about yes. your passion for this movie and the fear of a bad sequel like these are all the symptoms of a so fan true. I, i've been bitten <laughs> by the radioactive spider of fandom <laughs> Like wherever this goes, I mean, this is, this is the seed, like this movie is the seed of, um, you know, a franchise, I, I assume. So someday, you know, 20, do 20 years down the line, you'll be like the cranky old person who's like, back in my day, Spider-Verse was about this. <laughs> I know, like if I ever have a kid or like, or if I ever get a dog, I can put him in like a little Spider-Man onesie oh, yeah. or whatever. Like I'm going to be that kind of person. A Spider-Ham <laughs> onesie, a little like dog in a little Spider-Ham suit. <laughs> Oh, uh, I mean, yes, that's very <laughs> keep. I, I'll keep you posted on this <laughs> now that the seed has been planted. OK, do, uh, should we catch our breath and then get into the movie? Yes, I think it is now time. OK. <gasps> <laughs> that was me catching my breath, I guess, <laughs> grabbing it from the air. I never had it. <laughs> it's been gone. Yeah, so where should we begin on this saga? I try not to begin with the actual first second of the movie, but that seems to happen every time. And this one, I feel like the the uh, studio title cards at the beginning, you have to talk about it because it instantly lets you know. Yes. <laughs> that you're either on board for like this weird like <laughs> color, like bubblegum comic book adventure or you're not because you get like a million different aesthetics at once. And you're like, yep, oh, it's I get all those jokes. So good. And like the bass in this part is so resonant. And so it's like, it's escalating and escalating and things are getting weird and it's glitchy. I was immediately sold, by the way, at this part. I was like, oh, you have affected the, in the inner core of me as a person. Yeah. I'm here. Because it, it's kind of angsty. Like the, the characters in this movie are quite kind, I think, overall. But the tone of the music and the energy of some of this like glitchy stuff is quite dangerous. Like this, this is kind of a dark, it's got a bit of a dark mood. It's jokey, but it's kind of like dark comedy in a way to me for some reason. Yeah, I mean, it's wild <laughs> when you think about like how upbeat sort of this movie kind of is. And Peter Parker actually gets murdered so early yeah. in it like fully deceased that's mm -hmm. really intense like that's actually extremely brutal but it just doesn't feel that way but it does so yeah it's like it has a darkness to it but it's also so kind of like wholesome and tender and really energetic that you don't come out of it being like i can't believe i just saw peter parker get crushed to death by a giant man <laughs> right yeah like it, it the, the places well, the places where that darkness is not is, I just thought we'd start kind of with the setting. Like the the New York of this movie is fairly safe. Like any of the dangers appear when we enter the the accelerator room or some of these spaces where the, the evil characters reside. But Miles Morales' New York is like quite pleasant. Yeah, I would live here. Like in a way, mm -hmm. I have a weird relationship with New York City where I like sort of love it now as like a Northeasterner, but like really struggle. I felt like I didn't belong there when I lived there. I just didn't really know people and wasn't from there. And it just felt weird. I'm like from Oklahoma, mm -hmm. I don't know what I'm doing. Like I'm a <laughs> nerd. Um, but this way I was just like, this makes me love New York, the New York in this movie. I'm like, I don't know. And it, but it, it, it feels real in as much as it can in that way where it does feel very safe and it does feel weirdly pleasant. Yeah. But it just, if so textured that it's hard not to be like, this is a real place. Yeah. It feels like there's a lot of people there and it's, it's a very different New York for Miles than the New York 
of uh, older Spider-Man stories, which were more anxiety ridden because you have Peter trying to be like a photographer and he has to make money to pay his studio rent. And he's got to try to like pay to go out for a fancy dinner with his girlfriend. But Miles is New York is it's it's a school. It's his home life. And it's city streets that he knows really well. So it's it's a very different Spider-Man New York than we've seen in other Spider-Man or even superhero stories. Like he belongs here. Yeah. Which is not always the case. Yeah, I feel like it, like Gotham, honestly, is, yeah. I mean, it's very heightened. But that's like, you're thinking of cities in a superhero franchise. It's so grungy. And like the seedy underbelly is the whole city. <laughs> There's no not CD underbelly part of it. Yeah. And this, like, there are parts of it that feel so warm. Like, the school that Miles, I guess, used to attend, but the one he walks by in the morning on his way to Brooklyn Visions Academy uh -huh. looks exactly like a school I used to walk by every day when I lived in Brooklyn. And it just makes me feel so warm. Like, I'm like, it's so cute. I didn't know anybody that went to that school or anything, but, like, it reminds me of that nice kind of feeling of walking through the town. And I, yeah. It's got the energy of going to school in the morning. I mean, I, I lived way out in the country and I had to take a bus in. So it's not like I had this sort of walk to school where I'm like waving to people, but it still like feels familiar. And it's a great way to introduce his personality as he kind of like runs into all these different types of people and like works through the morning with his parents. Like they're kind of at odds with each other because he's like not ready, but he's he's getting it done and he gets out the door in time and it's not a big deal yeah you can't help but feel it's a great way to introduce a character because you're just like here's his life and here's his family and people like him and he seems like a sweet kid and like you get all of that from uh like in the scene it's the scene that you first see him he's like singing this song and he's getting the lyrics yes. wrong and he's like in his room and he's drawing and the directors were saying in this commentary that it was like this was the perfect way to meet him in this like intimate moment where you're just like here is him he's not interacting with anybody else he's not bouncing off of anyone else's behaviors like this is just him in his own environment and his own energy and like who can't immediately like him oh, like he's so cute yeah. he loves this song and he's super into it and he doesn't even know the words and he's like drawing and his room's yeah. a mess and you're just like yeah man like yeah, like I'm into this. And he's yeah, like, being well, all... <laughs> sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, we're, I think like people like you and I are particularly into it because yeah. he's drawing. <laughs> yeah, I will say I love that right? he's drawing. I do. With headphones on. I mean, it's like, that's what, that's the, I draw because I want to just sit with my headphones on. And I mean, my music is more Enya. Like that's my <laughs> yes. like, space. <laughs> Honestly, same. But yeah, like, but it's, it's that you love him from the beginning because you're like, oh, he's, he's got his own little space that he operates in. He's not just a part of the plot that we're going to get into. He has his own little world that he's being, he's going to get pulled out from later, which is why you like worry about him. But they give some time to like, let you know that he has interests. Like he likes to draw. It doesn't have to be part of the story, but it is, and it is important, but they could have like left shit like that out, but they didn't. They make him a, a real boy like Pinocchio. Yeah, <laughs> they do. I love how I'll probably talk to, about this a few more times in this movie because I don't have much to say about it right in this moment. But I find this movie like very joyful. Like there's an undercurrent of this movie uh, that kind of reminded me of our conversation uh it, about soul which was a lot more like on the nose about it this movie i don't think ever addresses it but i feel like this movie is also about how good it is to be alive like enjoying life mm. yeah. and i feel like some of that is like the first time you see him like he's like he's just a happy kid like he has kid problems and there are things that he's angsty about but none of it mm. is devastating and he's not like brooding and that's nice to see it is nice. And some people, I, I hear this term, oh, I hate bringing up shit that people say because they find like this weird pattern and want to like own an idea. But there's like this idea of like the nice core film, which like, you know, the new Wonder Woman maybe falls in that or soul movies that just want to make you feel good. Mm. And someone you could argue at the cost of like saying something, but I don't feel like this one sacrifices anything to make you feel good because it hits hard. Like when it's violent and angry and dark and hopeless, it really is also that, but it is also super nice. So like, this is one movie that it's like, they are truly in control of their emotions in every scene. Yeah. It, <laughs> it feels like they're saying stuff, actual stuff, which mm -hmm. is 
Always appreciate it. Yeah, please have something to say. God. I'm here for it. Okay. So there's a lot of good character introductions. Like we were kind of like joking around about the, like the origin story stuff. Is this about origin stories? Is it not? Like how many do we get? Do we really get them? But the way they introduce all, all the main characters, they sum them up so quickly and well, because I feel like it's, it's a good way to do voiceover where you're getting interesting action. You're getting all these great Spider-Man poses every time we meet a new Spider-Man, which is like the essence of Spider-Man is the perfect pose and all those poses are unique to the world of Spider-Man, like the bendy legs and like the little thwip fingers mm -hmm. and all that stuff. It's it's a great way to evoke the history of Spider-Man without this being just like a generic or like classic Spider-Man story. So shout out to all these Spider-Men. Oh, great Spider-Man. <laughs> I have heard pe some people say that they feel like they should have pared down on the number of Spider-Men that are in this movie. Okay. And I do not agree. But I'm curious your thoughts. Because uh, personally, honestly, I actually really remember sitting in the theater and by when Penny Parker is showing up uh -huh. and she's like, hello, I'm here and I'm in this movie too. That really is the moment where I was like, I love this movie. I had been feeling it throughout. Mm -hmm. But I remember marking that moment as like, you guys can do anything. I'm just into it. I feel like you're nailing it the entire time. This is great. And I don't think they should have taken them out. I don't think there were too many. I'm also curious to get your thoughts about this in the context of what we talked about with Soul, where there was this issue of kind of taking the movie away from the main character and making it feel weird. Yeah. And I actually feel like this movie manages to have a ton of extra main main characters like quote unquote not exactly but it doesn't ever feel to me like they're robbing miles morales of his screen time or of his story i actually feel like they're very thoughtfully used yeah well first of all this movie moves so fast that they're able to squeeze a lot in and there's so much shorthand built into the archetypes of these characters like as soon as every iteration of a spider-man appears on screen you get who it is like you get the subtle difference between the Peter B. Parker in the original Peter Parker and the Miles Morales instantly. So I think they they play off what we know about superhero types really well to allow for all this flexibility. I guess if you were trying to argue that we could lose some of the Spider-Men because maybe there's just excessive spider flavor, they're all so different. I don't know which one is redundant enough to lose. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, I like busy design. Yeah. But if it gets too busy when something seems like it's redundant of something else in it, but each of the, the Spider-Ham or the noir Spider-Man or Gwen Stacy, they're all so clearly defined. You can't really say that they're extra because they're, uh, they're all finding their own place. Yeah. So, and no, I think in one... On. Yeah, you should... Totally agree. Hard agree. Spider-Ham, not in this movie? No. Don't... John Mulaney Pointless. does a great job, by the way. Yeah. Uh, hold, I'm going to hold that thought because I think we should talk about some of the voice acting. But to conclude yeah. this, uh, I did read at one point somebody specifying that the trio, I guess, of Spider-Ham, uh, Noir Spider-Man, and Penny Parker are too much. And I think it's because they're focusing in on them because they don't really have a richness to them that the others do. Because I think like Gwen Stacy is more of an active character. You know, she, they're there a little bit more for the emotional beats, but I still don't think you should cut any of them. Like, I still, it just doesn't feel like they're taking up more room than what they're adding. Yeah. I mean, the whole idea of the movie is the overwhelming nature of like, guess what? You're part of this bigger situation where like you, you, well, hold on. I'm not sure. Because I one question <laughs> I do one him. question I do have that I wonder if the sequels will address is what are the stakes of so if you disappear from the the you know all right if you travel outside of your universe you start to glitch and you will eventually what disappear and like disintegrate return to yours or are or no. are you dead yeah the implication is that you die in a really horrifically painful way okay so that that's what the stakes are individually. So my the haziness I have with this movie is 
in a sequel, is Miles Morales going to start to venture into other Spider-Verses? And if he does, is it just going to be the classic, like, if one collapses, it all breaks down and it just gets so abstract because there's so many different, you know, versions of reality. So, I, yeah. I you know, I guess once you introduce all these characters and they all have their own reality, you do start to want to visit those places. Like, I mean, maybe... The next one is the Gwen movie or something. I really have no idea. Like maybe it's going to be more like that. We just shift to a different Spider-Verse altogether. Yeah, well, there's only one way to find out. But it is interesting. And I, I do think them playing with like the multiverse thing and introducing this aspect, like they pull it off really well in this movie. It's kind of like the very rare, well made time travel story where you don't think about it because it's mm -hmm. so hard not to think about it and pick it apart and in this one you don't really while you're watching it but in a sequel it could easily become a problem like you just have to let it get out of hand because you know if there if there's a sequel and then somebody has some magic technology that makes you not disintegrate in other <laughs> dimensions just to facilitate a plot of needing to do that like it's gonna be like oh you know so like what are they gonna do who knows it's it'll be interesting to see how they handle that. Yeah, I, I almost wonder if they're I'm sure they're not kicking themselves because they can do whatever they want in a way and everybody's going to be on board because I think this team is so savvy that they can just maybe even give you a whole new formula and convince you that it was always going to be this way. But uh, yeah, they. if I was like involved in a project like this, it seems overwhelming. It is on the edge of a knife that it's about to like fall apart at any moment because we have so many realities. But the fun of it is the juggling of all these characters and watching them. Like maybe one of my favorite little moments is when they're in his bedroom and the other spider people are on the ceiling moving as a little cluster. Mm -hmm. It's like you can only have a, a little moment like that when you have this giant group of characters. And there's so I'd many like movies. to note also that they specifically designed that cluster to look like a spider. So there yeah. are like eight limbs <laughs> sticking out in the appropriate places and it's just fucking solid gold. Yeah, Ugh. like chaotic, st like, you know, if you love the Goonies, you love that it's chaos. And yeah, there's probably too many kids in that movie, but the joy of that movie is that there are too many kids in that movie. Yeah. <laughs> so it's uh, to me, it's kind of like that. It's just so kinetic and it's animated too, which is insane that they can do this sort of, because something we've criticized maybe about some of the older Pixar is the worlds feel very empty. It's at some points, like they just don't have the technology to like make these like crowded chaotic scenes. But this movie indulges the ability to do that by giving you so many characters and making them feel like really physically engaging with each other. Um, and they're all friends. They're all best friends. That's right. Not really only are moving they there at the end. <laughs> yeah, they're all friends, which is like <laughs> and that they're extra homies magic at sauce. the end. Yeah. Yeah. They all appreciate each other's plight. Like they're all still connected to that original idea of a Spider-Man in some way, even though they're all like vastly different. I yeah, don't know. I it's actually, kind of spiritual, actually. I totally <laughs> I'm feeling that so strongly and like that has given me the most solid reasoning for why they shouldn't cut them. And it's because this whole movie is about how anyone can be this and anyone can do this. And it's about di like the beauty of diversity and collaboration mm -hmm. and like piling on more Spider-Man and even like being really gutsy by having a bunch of really weird and out there Spider-Man characters in this and still sticking the landing. It's just mm -hmm. like, oh, it just really resonates. And it that drives home the messaging. It's like truly... This can be anything to anyone. And like gatekeeping is stupid. <laughs> and I totally agree. Right. Gatekeeping is like, it's like the way people in these industries like hang on to their fucking jobs. No gatekeepers. Like, That's yeah, I'm no. the gatekeeper gatekeeper. And I'm here to tell you that there are no more gatekeepers allowed. Yeah. The illusion that like gatekeeping preserves an authenticity or like excels in art form is not true. So if that's like your reasoning for gatekeeping, like fuck that. And something not to get back to the teaching thing, but when this movie came out, I was doing like school visits. And if, if you don't believe that diversity and representation is important to these movies and that there needs to be people of color and like vastly different types of characters in this sort of like mainstream content, you need to like walk into a school and 
watch the joy come over a kid's face when they talk about a movie like this, because this movie is clear to kids that it is inviting them to like have a role in the world. Like that is the purpose of this movie is to let you know you can be somebody. And here's a giant list of people. Here's a bunch of strange characters that are, you've never seen on the big screen before, just having a great time and doing stuff and making friends and saving the day. And it, it just means so much to a kid to see that stuff. Like that's the critic proofness of this movie is like, you can't badmouth this movie. It truly is important. <laughs> it just yeah, is. It's, it's saying something and it's saying something that is awesome and that it, people need to hear, honestly, yeah. judging by the world today <laughs> and how some people be. But like, yeah, there's a little monologue at the end that Miles does and he's just like, anybody can do this. When he just like, you could say it's cheesy maybe if you want to say that like anyone can wear the mask thing. But I'm like... Actually, it's like really good to say that. And it's really good to say that a lot. Yeah. And loudly. And sometimes people need to hear it and shut up if you have a problem with it. Yeah. I'm gatekeeping this. You can't say this is bad because it it's not. It's like such a resonant good. It's such a, I will say too, like everything about this movie is just cascading into like hitting all of my right notes of like what is good. Mm -hmm. And that is true. Just like. If you're in a creative industry and you're not, I don't know, of a certain situation, shit is tough. There is a lot of gatekeeping. There's a lot of like bad history in creative industry, in all industries, mm -hmm. you know? And like, I, I crave creative content that is like, we should all work together more. <laughs> Things are actually better if we work together. <laughs> like, yeah. That is so true. What a great point. Let's not be pointlessly competitive. Like, let's not be... You know, I did this because I made the right choices and I'm very smart. Like, no, let's all just like muddle through this together and make stuff that's great. And you did. This movie is freaking phenomenal. So case in point. <laughs> yeah, it can be done. It, it's evidence and it's planting a seed for, um, you know, other people down the line. And maybe we aren't seeing it right away. Like I, I don't expect and I didn't expect to see a bunch of Spider-Verse ripoffs right away because this movie is so well done you can't i bet people were afraid to do a bad version of it because the world would turn <laughs> on you yeah <laughs> you know like you you can't just steal the like let's make it let's switch to 12 frames a second and make it look like a comic book it's not that simple to do this <laughs> and i know and it other would be, studios knew that yeah if you chase a strong flavor like that even if you do nail it, everyone's going to know what you're doing. So it just True. doesn't yeah. make sense. But we'll see. Okay, let's go through some of the uh, the, the stuff in this movie we like. So just, just story structure wise, I like the way they use... Um, I guess I'm a sucker for this in any sort of adventure movie. But the shifting of a costume look, the way Miles evolves through spider man costumes is a great way to just kind of break up the structure of this movie. Like you get the act one costume, which is basically the Halloween costume that we all get stuck with when we're a kid. And we want to be these characters so bad. You just, or even as an adult, like me last yeah, exactly. year, <laughs> just like reliving this, like there's, there's just having the tag hanging off it and all these little visual things like the costumes, not quite right. It's like the stuff that frustrates you as a kid but you still have like no option. I feel like it. Uh, this version one costume Miles has like really captures that awkwardness. So yeah, well, we can't let this podcast go by without talking about the iconic meme scene where Peter B. Parker is like hunched over and he's thinking about like, what am I going to do to like do this? And then Miles like crouches down to do it yeah. too. And he's in his like cute little costume. And I'm like, yes. It's so obvious. It's not like a subtle nod or anything. It's like this kid needs to figure out how to be Spider-Man and he's got the fake Spider-Man costume on and he's imitating it. But it's just so good. Like that's I you just like you love to see it, actually. Well, I was just going to pin that back to the idea that um, this movie is about creativity in a way, because that early stage of imitation is the part of the creative process. It's like, oh, here's an idol. And maybe they're not what they once were, but they're still, I still see it in them. And you still want to like be like that, that, that yeah. position, that pose you were just describing, you know, like that little scene kind of speaks to that to me. 
And you know what, too? In the same way, Miles knows and has openly acknowledged that Peter B. Parker is not a good role model and right. sucks. But you know what's cool is that he's so into it. Like, he wants to learn it. So he's going to do – he's going to learn it any way he can. And that I love. Because he's just – palpably disappointed with Peter B. Parker and uh-huh. his whole situation. But I love that he he is Spider-Man already. And he knows that that is like who he is and what he's trying to step up to be. So he's like, any information I can glean from this, like I'm going to start like doing this role. Yeah. And I just love that because it says something about him too. And the I'm passionate about something or I have this thing that I need to, you know, get more into. And I'm just going to do it any way I can. Like, it's in my nature. It just speaks to both of the characters really beautifully, I think. Yeah, and it speaks to anybody who's ever tried to accomplish something. Because I I think one of the defining character traits of Spider-Man that makes us enjoy him is the resourcefulness. And, like, Miles has that because everybody can be resourceful. That's like... And you can, the point is to do work with what you've got, which is like what Spider-Man is always doing, which is why you can, he can be beloved because he's just figuring it out as he goes and he believes in himself. And it's like, those are all things we want to see. Yeah, we love them. Yeah, we don't need to see him. uh... So, you know, last time we were talking a bit about the hero's journey. It's like, okay, we've seen this so many times. There's so many like beats of the hero's journey that aren't, logical in some ways. So for example, the like denial of the call, this movie might have that a little bit, but there's no point where Miles really turns his back or like is delusional or doesn't think he's going to do this. You know, he's always trying to figure it out. Like he's never, he's never turning back against. Yeah. (laughs) I never really either understood and there's a lot of kids media that have characters that react that way and i've never gotten it like a brief aside which i can't believe i haven't somehow managed to bring up on this podcast before but in the classic book series animorphs yeah there's this one character because that that series in a nutshell is like an ensemble series about these like five kids or whatever and they're all very different they all are like kind of occupy a personality niche you know in this child's media and when they get these like magic powers to turn in animals, that it's the same time that they learn that the earth is like being taken over by body snatching aliens. And there's one kid in particular, Marco, bless his heart, who is like, I'm out. I'm not helping. I'm just going to go live my normal life. Like, I don't want to do that. Mm-hmm. And even as a kid, I was like, how are you ever going to be able to sleep at night now that you know this? Like yeah. the, the can't, it's open. Like it's the box is opened The world is full of, like, body-snatching aliens. Like, you know that now. You'll never be able to forget it. You can't live a normal life. You don't have a choice. And so I didn't – I don't understand it. And I don't – I think it's sort of weird – I love that series, by the way. So this is not, like, a criticism of Animorphs, per se. I sort of understand it. I just don't really like it because I I don't think – like, a lot of kids understand responsibility or understand that, like, stuff has to get done – When things are bad or whatever. So I like that in this movie, there is the fully understandable freak out of like, no, 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 I don't want this. And then he pretty quickly goes into how can I handle it? And I like that a lot, especially when you're like, when he's threatened with something that is reality shattering, literally, he knows about this collider thing. He knows that his family could get deleted and millions of people too. And he talks with real concern about like all of the people that live in New York City. He cares enough to do something about it. Mm -hmm. without question and i'm like that is more of a message that i can get behind because like what choice do you even really have especially if you give a shit (laughs) about people like it's so it's so cute and admirable and kind of like he's just like no these are like real stakes this isn't just about my life so like i have to do something about it right he's looking at the the bigger picture which is like you know pretty mature and not something that gets worked into a lot of these stories which is why you know sometimes these superhero movies People have to be like, they have to put their hand up and say, uh, what about everybody that died during that fight between Doomsday and S- Superman? Uh, <laughs> you know, didn't anybody care? You know, they, these movies get so singularly focused on the plights and the journey of the character. They, they're they basically in a bubble and it becomes unrelatable. And at some point it becomes uninteresting unless you just love the fantasy of being in your own bubble. And that's what you wish you could do. This movie doesn't 
do that at all. It's like the way of the world is we, we have to work together or nothing works. Like that's just the truth of it. There's no one hero. So good. So good. So <laughs> we, we have yet to like zone in on anything specifically. I like, do which, have one. I have yeah. a scene I'd like to talk about that Let's get there. doesn't have anything to do with any of the stuff we've been talking about. But I think it's one of the most important scenes in the movie. I'm going to start a little bit earlier, actually, because I was going to go directly to it's the scene where Miles and his uncle Aaron are in the subway yeah. and they're graffitiing and bonding. And that's just a great scene for so many reasons. I'm going to back it up a little bit, though, to talk about the first scene where Miles goes to his uncle's apartment. Mm -hmm. And God, this movie, another thing it really nails, which like... I guess it's almost like a generic statement at this point that like, oh, like you should show and not tell when you're like telling a visual story. But this movie crushes it at that. There's no dialogue in this movie where they're like, my uncle Aaron is really cool and has a lot of money. I don't know what he does for a living, but no, 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 no. Like there's none of that. It's just everything is very organic. And like the way you're introduced to this character is like he climbs up the fire escape and like sneaks into his apartment that way, mm -hmm. essentially. And he's like sending his uncle like these dumb little like, I don't know, Snapchats or something with like little Instagram stickers, like little stuff on him. And he's yeah. like being cute. And you just learn so much about their relationship in that way. You learn so much about Aaron only because of his apartment, like his aesthetic and his like treatment of Miles, like their relationship. Mm -hmm. And there's so much tender the tenderness to their relationship where he's like, yeah, this is a cool uncle. No wonder Miles looks up to him. He is cool. He's like got a lot of cool stuff. He's obviously like very like fit and he's got like a like a boxing bag in his apartment. <laughs> yeah. And you know, he's talking to Miles about girls and you're like, this is freaking adorable. Which makes it all the more actually crushing when you find out that he's kind of the bad guy. Right. Like they pull that off so well. Yeah, it's a good twist. I don't actually remember if I saw it coming. I mean, I probably kind of knew there would have to be something with him, but you you don't want it to happen. Like you really want the uncle who seems to be bringing out all the things Miles really cares about and the things he's actually thinking about. Whereas his dad is more hyper focused on his like you're in a good school now. You earned it. Be here. Keep your head down. Kind of like do the thing. Whereas his uncle's like no, indulge your interests. Like let's figure you out, which is like what you want for the characters you care about. So yeah, it's a shame that he just lost that person in his life, which is going to make the second one even like kind of sad in that way, because there isn't that tension of the two father figures, you know, losing yeah, that is a true loss. <laughs> it really is on so many levels. And like Aaron is just such an interesting character. Like we were talking about earlier. So I just want to know more about him. I like to spend more time with him. Yeah. So... He's got a true backstory. Like he, it's also naturalistic. Like you were saying, just every little beat of the way these characters it, it's like these the days in in this story, they are normal days. It's not like this, everything was leading to the one day where Miles found the thing and now he's the greatest human who ever lived. Like the, 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 the storytelling isn't weighty in that way. Like this feels like a normal day interrupted by extreme circumstances. You know, the way he's coming yeah. home, the way they're chatting. The, it's not like life or death girl problems or whatever, or school problems. It's just like, yeah, you know, like this is, this is where I am in my life and I'm trying to figure it out. Yeah. Let's talk about it. Let's do some graffiti. Let's like listen to the song together. It just is so low key. It's makes it way more believable. Right. Yeah, it does. It does feel really real and everything about Miles's whole mindset. You can kind of understand mm -hmm. and like why he thinks Aaron is cooler to hang out with. And it's like, you feel like there's the emotional connection here, but also like it's funny because, yeah, probably a reason why that is, is because Aaron doesn't have the responsibility of being his father. Yeah. <laughs> like it's like one of those weird things. Thing. Yeah. Right. Um, But the whole situation they have painting, like doing the graffiti in the subway. I have a lot. To, well, I don't even have a lot to say about it, but like really one of the main reasons I bring it up besides all of that emotional richness of these two characters interacting is like, it's just such a, that scene is like, this is Spider-Verse. If you had to, 
It's yeah. one of the scenes, at least in this movie, that I think is most iconic about it. And even just little things like he's spray painting on the wall and the spray paint is like hitting up on the screen too. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, fuck, you yeah. guys are geniuses. Like, and it's such a small little thing. And it's just like, yeah, immerse me in this shit. And the music is great. How they did the music in this movie is so freaking cool. And like the spider is coming down and it's like glitching in time with the music. And everything is like these neon fluorescent, like wild colors. And it's just like transcendent. It's so good. Yeah, the pieces all come together. And it it um it just makes you feel good as an artist in pursuit of trying to create these little like perfect formulas of style and substance and making it all work and being this like great little package of something valuable to other people like that. That scene is just kind of doing that as he sort of like figures out what his design is. And he's like, you know, it's like, these things are not just stuff to look at. Like they're, they're self-expression. They're people like on these journeys of, of trying to figure out who they are. And the thing they make is only the evidence after the fact. So, it, I mean, I think that's just going to come up more and more with these animations is seeing behind the screen and being like, yeah, this is a story about like trying to figure yourself out by people who probably struggled with trying to figure their self out <laughs> as they were young artists <laughs> and the way most books are about authors. <laughs> animations yeah. are about people that like to draw and design shit <laughs> that does make a lot of sense when you now that you mention it that does i also in the scene unrelated to that but mm. i like that when he gets bitten by the spider there's no fanfare no <laughs> like it does that like da -da -da, like something really epic is gonna happen and then he just kills literally just kills the spider and moves on yeah and it's just good that's a good way to handle that, I think. I love that they're constantly winking at the whole Spider-Man thing and being like, we're just doing whatever we want with it. And like, this is funny, so we're doing that. Well, that's the punkness of it to me, I think. It's just sort of like thumbing your nose or whatever at the the moment you're supposed to acknowledge. Just turn your back on it. Like, yeah, and in a loving so way, cool. too. Yeah, yeah I don't <laughs> right. feel like they're being like, fuck you, but it's like, nah, like we're kind of, we're the new kid and we're like doing what we want. Yeah, it's cocky, for sure. <laughs> oh, that swagger, that animation swagger yeah. that they have. So uh, now maybe you know, I feel like I came across this when I was reading something about this movie when it came out, but is the first scene that they conceived of and animated when they were trying to figure out what this looked for, is that the look of the movie? I mean, um, is that the graveyard scene? Is that like the origin of what this uh, movie is going to look and feel like? Or am I wrong there? I don't know if it was the first one. I do. They mentioned on this director's commentary, which means that I'm now an expert on all of it. <laughs> that scene. So the graffiti scene we were just talking about was apparently pretty emblematic. The scene that uh, Miles has Peter B. Parker like strung up in his own apartment mm -hmm. or I don't know where they are, but they're in some apartment and he has him like tied up. Uh, and then also the graveyard scene were all very early. Okay, yeah. So I don't know which one came first, but yes, like I think uh, one of them mentioned, one of the directors mentioned that the graveyard scene was at least maybe the first time they animated Miles and they were trying to figure out still how that worked, like what he looked like, how he expressed and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's what that's what I encountered. So it's just it's fun to see those little. Uh, I don't know if it was like, what do you call it? Like an animatic when it's unfinished. It's kind of like a moving storyboard or something like that. Yeah. Animatic. You got yeah. it. OK, cool. Let me you just got throw, it unlock. throw out terms that I barely understand. <laughs> it's a good move. It's a previs. <laughs> it's a post viz situation. All right. So how about how about Gwen? So first of all, I'd like to say voice acting wise, Gwen is voiced by Haley Steinfeld, who is in one of my favorite movies of all time. True Grit, the Coen Brothers movie. Have you mm -hmm. ever seen that? Yes. I, there is something about that story. It's like the perfect story. I just there's nothing I would take out or add. And the book is great. It's like the pinnacle of like Western adventure and it's so action-packed and sad and she is awesome in that movie yeah uh, god how young was she in that movie exactly yeah she's like a fucking little kid but she just 
she just understands that character. So I just wanted to shout her out. I love her voice. And she's a, a very cool Gwen. She's very, you know. She's an awesome Gwen. She doesn't raise her voice, I don't think, in this movie at all. Gwen is just kind of kind of quiet, kind of whispery. But like clear, clear-minded. Confident, yeah. yeah. But I, I, I like that. It's nice. Yeah, I totally agree. It's a nice twist on, on a kind of like secondary female character. Because I guess something maybe we do lose is a little bit. I kind of would have liked a little bit more of her. But, you know, whatever. There's more movies to come. And th- that's always going to be something. But Yeah, I do get the feeling that if the sequel... I don't know exactly where the sequel is going. But I imagine there's greater plans there for her. I felt that pretty strongly about her specifically. Like, to the point that, like, I'm not even sure if Peter B. Parker is going to show up in much more like, of, like, an official capacity. But yeah. I think that it would make a lot of sense to me that she does. Yeah, Peter B. Parker seems fairly resolved. Like, it's going to be one of those, all right, well, he he got Mary Jane back. What else? And lost the extra weight. Or, I don't know. I just don't really see anything left to say about him. Whereas Gwen, we don't really... Uh, we like understand who she is, but she, she, there's more to say about her, I think for sure. Yeah. Right? And I think there's something to say about their, like she and Miles clearly connect mm-hmm. during this. Uh, I don't even know exactly what the core of that is because there is no like hitting you over the head moment where they're like, we both experience the same feeling, but, and maybe it's just because they're similar in age, but like they clearly kind of click. And I think there's more to explore there with their friendship or relationship or whatever, if that's like where they're going with it. Mm -hmm. But there's something about them kind of being the closest in circumstance, maybe of all the spider men that show up in this. Yeah. Spider people that they're, yeah, they're kind of on the same level. Yeah, she's like a mentor, but not fully developed. She's just, she's like one step or two steps ahead of him or something. Like yeah, she's they got mention some things figured out, right? One of her last lines to him at the end is like, you know, I'm older than you. And she says, it's right. like, oh, I think it's like 15 months yeah. specifically. <laughs> yeah. And then she's like, it's not much, but it's kind of significant. And that's like one of the last things she says to him. And I'm like, honestly, that's, that's true. And it's enough for me to think you both... Like, you're just different enough that you're not literally peers, but you guys have a lot in common. There's a lot of opportunities for you to go through experiences together yeah. and kind of grow together by virtue of that. So, yep. and we'll she's, see. She's still young enough where she would point something like that out because that's such a kid thing to do. Like Oh, totally. Age, like, it, age like it matters. Yeah. <laughs> like, it, like it matters at all and it totally doesn't. Yeah. I love it though. I do. I mean, obviously I loved her a lot. I couldn't even tell you why. I have no idea why, but I did. I just I responded to her as a character for sure. Yeah. Loved all these characters, um, but I'd love look. to see more of her. Yeah, she's she's cool as hell. Yeah, she's so cool. Yeah, I want I, that haircut so bad. I almost got that haircut. I'm not even gonna play. I know it's like yeah, it's it's very it's rules. alluring. She has uh well, they all the Spider Men have their own way of moving. Like she, hers is kind of rooted in dance. Like she has kind of ballet slipper shoes. Mm-hmm. Which um, must be some sort of backstory, which brings up a point where where they flash back to her. She's like playing the drums, which I'm like, OK, she's a drummer. But why why don't they flash to her being a dancer? Because it seems like that's clearly part of her personality. I don't know. That was like one little moment. I, I it's not I don't have a problem with it, really. But I'm like, oh, if we're getting her backstory. She seems how more, dare you? <laughs> she seems more real than some of the other more cartoonish spider mm-hmm. people like she the, the noir character i only picture him living in darkness and rain as he says but gwen seems like she actually has a real life with hobbies and stuff yeah so i i was just yes drumming could be a secondary hobby also but i just thought that was an interesting choice they must have just picked it because it looks cool when somebody's playing the drums well i also i did think about this because i hadn't really thought about her being a dancer even though of course she is wearing literal ballet shoes and she says during this montage uh when miles still hasn't really come into his own and they're all like are you sure you can handle it like are you sure you can handle yourself and they're kind of like punching him and like beating him up as a group sort of to try to get him to like get his shit together Mm -hmm. and they're all saying different things to him and it's coming very fast but one of the things that gwen says is like can you kind of like, can you move with, like, the control of a dancer or yeah, something exactly. like that? And she specifically says dancer. But I do kind of wonder, the montage that you're talking about where you see her playing the drums is very, like, this is my backstory. And it also includes, like, the raw sort of 
her friend getting killed and like yeah. all this different stuff is happening. And I kind of wonder if that's supposed to show like the raw side I guess, <laughs> and maybe right. dancing is like too controlled or like, I'm just making this up, but like, what if dancing was a big part of her life because it's more of like, my parents wanted me to do this and I had to do it every year or something. Mm -hmm. And the drums are what she's doing, like more as she's like coming into her own and like doing her own thing. I mean, I don't know, but yeah, that's like that's how I'm point. making it up in my head to like make it work. I also really like her a lot. Oh yeah, me too. That's why I <laughs> writing just have fan fiction. About about her. <laughs> but uh, again, we come back to that idea of like artistic expression because it's like, oh, I'm a dancer, but now I'm a drummer. I'm no longer a dancer. That's such a growing up move where you're like, no, now I play guitar this year. But yeah, sure, maybe I learned piano when I was young, but yeah. that's not me anymore. It's such like these identity crisis moments. Um, maybe it's it's kind of something like that. We're probably both reading too much into it, but I like that sort of reading yeah <laughs> right. i like it i'm into it make it call call me actually sony yeah we'll put the number at the bottom of the screen i am available <laughs> superimpose that on the podcast <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, just like a flashing number 1-800 caitlin please <laughs> i love you <laughs> yeah. um what else do we got here uh, okay can i point out something that i think this movie is nope you go too far. No, what? What's I mean, up? there's no way you were going to say I love this movie so much and I wasn't going to do it. But I don't want to hear anymore. <laughs> okay. So this the energy level is so high on this movie. I Here's a Spider-Man trait that I don't like. And I don't think this movie is really doing it. But the uh, Tom Holland movies are where they kind of tech up Spider-Man and make him kind of James Bondy or Iron Man-ish. I hate all that shit. It's against the principles of Spider-Man. This movie mostly ignores that, except when we do this Aunt May, she's got a secret lair below the thing and it's got all the costumes. It is all very fun and I, I don't want it to go away. I understand the tone of the movie. It's not breaking the tone, but I do love a good cartoon old person. Like I I think mm, Moana, yeah. love, love the grandmother in Moana. Coco, yeah, the grandma is one of the best characters. Yes, in Coco also, like these just like mm -hmm. the heart and the, the reminder that, you know, it's all a bigger thing. I feel like Aunt, Aunt May is kind of doing that, but they make her so silly with her being like in charge of this lair that in a way makes no sense that she like, how do they have that? And yes, I'm being stupid, but I just would have liked her to be a little older and uh, just a little more grounded. But I know there's no time for every character to feel real. That's like just too much storytelling. And part of it is, yeah, I don't know. Um, it's interesting to me. There are two little tidbits about Aunt May that I know people like went to bat to include. And one of them I learned today, and I cannot tell you which was which. I'm so sorry, directors of Spider-Verse, if you're listening for some reason. <laughs> uh, I couldn't tell your voices apart. I don't know who was talking. But uh, Aunt May kicks her own door open when she's yeah. taking them to the backyard. And honestly, I have always loved that. And I've always noticed it. I'm like, that is wild that she's just like, bow. But one of the, one of the directors is like, yeah, I told you to take that out. Like I cut that from the movie, but then you put oh, it back shit. in and like, but then he's like, but I was wrong. Like you should have had it. Like it's good. And I was like, I do kind of agree, but I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. And she is a cartoon, but in a way I'm just like, I kind of want to be like that when I'm old. <laughs> like yeah, I kind of want to carry myself with that, yeah, and with that energy. Like she seems very confident in a way that I like, and that honestly, maybe you don't really see a lot of old people in movies being like, "I'm good, I'm smart, and I'm cool, and I can like do stuff, and I'm fine," and not frazzled either by anything that's happening. She's very just like on it. Oh yeah, I'm not asking for her to be um like timid or or weak minded or anything. And I know a lot of the movies kind of put her in that place, but there's also this core of aunt May in some of the stories that settles Peter by her being a little more mellow. And I think it, it could have just been like this extra little, just turning her back a bit. Yeah. Like cutting that door kicking scene and just letting her balance these characters that are leaning so hard into this adventure. I don't know, just a, just a little thought. Again, not a problem. I just wanted to piss you off by just hating on Aunt May for a podcast second. Podcast <laughs> is done. We had a good run. Yep. Roll podcast credits. I say I, it was worth it. I just... <laughs> <laughs> I put it down to Aunt May. I don't know. Um, I do, too, though. I kind of get... 
like I agree with exactly what you said about I don't think they should change it in the movie or anything, but that the like James Bond tier like Batcave of Spider-Man is like feels wrong. Like it doesn't even feel wrong in this movie because they're the context of like we are all kind of crashing in super Peter Parker's right yeah. thing. Mm-hmm. So I'm glad it's in that context. But in any other situation, it is like a little too much. And I, I think that's one of the reasons like you find Miles so endearing is like he literally has none of that at all. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah, and that's really nice. And it doesn't really seem like any of the others do, except for maybe Penny Parker with her laser robot. Yeah. uh, Which is his own thing, and I'm totally into and fine with. And he, I mean, none of these characters are overpowered in the way it's so easy to do um, and could possibly happen, you know, in a sequel if they're not careful. But, like, Penny's robot does not survive this movie, right? No, yeah. That's sad. It is. I think it makes a little sad face, too. It's very emotive. Although, I think... So I'm pretty sure... I don't know exactly to what extent the robot is its own autonomous thing and how much the little radioactive spider that she's bonded with is controlling that. Because she has a spider friend who survives and doesn't die. Right. The soul of the robot lives on. Yeah. So, like, we have the stakes at this acceptable level. But then it does. It's kind of a bummer. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it was her dad's robot too. Yeah, they sort of gloss over a lo- like briefly in her backstory, but mm-hmm. like, it's kind of sad. Yeah, it's sad. Yeah, all these characters have a a sad element to them. Spider, like the noir guy, is just sad because his the world he's from <laughs> is just perpetually dark and sad. He's like wildly depressed. There's no levity in his universe, which <laughs> so he's the far side of it. Even Spider Man or Spider Ham probably has a little sadness in him. Well, I want to bring up a little anecdote about him mm-hmm. that I think is funny that you might have heard because I've heard it a few times. But uh, in the scene where they're all in Miles' dorm room and they're trying to leave him there and not take him with them on their final mission, uh, it's right after the Prowler dies, mm-hmm. his uncle. And he saw it happen and he was like there when he passed. And he's obviously traumatized and really upset. And so they all kind of go around and they're like, you know, this happened to all of us. Like for me, it was my Uncle Ben. It was my Uncle Benjamin. And, you know, it was my best friend, whatever. And Spider-Ham doesn't say one. Yeah. (laughs) But originally he did. And the line was, for me, it was my Uncle Frankfurter. He was electrocuted. He smelled so delicious. Oh, that's weird. Which is fucked up. And like... (laughs) So apparently, like, all the directors were like, this is really funny, and people always laughed really hard at it, but it, like, totally ruined the emotional yeah, moment, so we it. took it out, and now he doesn't say any specific person who dies, but he does have this, like, tender moment where he's like, I think just it legitimately feels really real for coming out of a cartoon spider pig character, is when he says, like, the hardest part about this job is that you can't always save everyone, yeah. and it's nice for them to acknowledge mm how present death is in the story. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Like there are, there are stakes and it's, it's like we lose a, a main character that we spent the first like act of the movie caring about. I, I wanted to give a bit of the backstory with the Miles Morales comic version, because when we get to this scene in the movie, now I believe in the comic book, Aaron dies from an explosion triggered during a battle between Miles and Aaron. And the last thing Aaron says is, you are just like me. Damn. Yeah. (laughs) We're not so different, you and I. I just thought, um, obviously, that there is no room in this movie for that sort of (laughs) placing that on our main character. But uh, I just wanted to point that out because I just think, you know, adaptation... Yeah, we'll get into that when we talk about, you know, even something like the Little Mermaid, the things we take from these, Mm -hmm. you know, myths and stories, you know, the story of Spider-Man is bigger than this one movie. So I just thought it's, it's kind of interesting to, um, they, they want this character, but they don't want all the weightiness of them just enough where it, uh, there's stakes, but not all the stakes. (laughs) That makes sense to me too. Not knowing anything else about their relationship before or after that moment in the comics, But it makes sense in my mind, especially if you're going for some kind of Uncle Ben parallel, that to have it end in such a way that it is a little bit traumatic and sticks with you. And that's not to say that it would definitely be traumatic to find out that your like best friend slash cool uncle 
was willing to murder you until he knew who you were, like were because he's a crime dude. Like that's very traumatic, but there's sort of a redemptive ending where the uncle is like, I don't, he doesn't say this, but he basically kind of says, I don't want this for you. Like you were, you're good. And maybe he's sort of hinting at like, you have all the good qualities of me and your father. And like, you need to just like run with that and you need to go with that. And it's, it's really sad, but it's also like a hopeful way for him yeah. to go. And it, in a way that is appropriate for a closed loop, like exactly. this is a movie. You don't know if you're going to get a sequel, whatever. So you can't necessarily slot in that like future angst mm -hmm. yeah. of which there is still plenty of room because, again, definitely a traumatic situation. But I like how they changed it in this to be something that could affect him now and, and like f not you don't walk out of the theater being like oh my god but like <laughs> that horrible thing it, it happens so late in the movie it's not like uncle ben dies pretty early on in like the this like spider-man toby Maguire first one right. that's like a really inciting moment and it's like it's not that in this so it needs to be a little bit more resolved when it, it happens it would be like another inciting incident right like we already have miles origin story which is kind of experiencing the the other peter parker dying and him passing like the usb dongle and all that stuff and that's so much lighter because it's it's more like a legacy that he's picking up it's like he's pulling the sword from the stone in yeah. a way whereas if it's his uncle you know telling him that you're just like me that yeah like you're saying they they do the filmmakers knew enough to cut that off because this movie has to end in a satisfying way if there's going to be a sequel they have to let themselves go in a different direction it can't be about aaron and like the ghost of aaron coming back to him which is also so boring when characters return in ghost form star wars um yeah but uh, like, canceled it's boring like, just let these characters die and we'll remember them in our minds. You don't have to show it on screen constantly. But we meet all the other, uh, all all of Kingpin. We haven't even talked about Kingpin. I uh, do really quickly yeah. before you want to pivot to this. I just, for those who don't know, I just want to say one more thing about, because just because we've been talking about all the other Spider-Men and them showing up and their little origin stories and stuff. Um I didn't notice this is like the third time I watched this movie, but like Spider Ham, uh, it was originally a spider who was bitten by a radioactive pig. <laughs> right. <laughs> which I think is just absolutely hysterical. I don't know if that is true to the comics, but it's fucking hilarious. And it, it goes by so quickly because all three, like Noir Spider Man and Penny Parker and him, are all saying their lines at the same time at that point. It's very frenetic, but it's even animated. <laughs> Yeah. And it's just comedy gold. It is. Just absolutely amazing, 100%. I just wanted to draw attention to that because it's so phenomenal. Yeah, that's probably the most important thing you've said tonight. <laughs> I've cracked the emotional core of this movie. The, the jokes right are strong now. in this. Like, all the gags, the gags are good. They get comics. They get comics and they get gags. And I get it. And I love it. <laughs> uh, we, we haven't even talked about... Dr. Octopus or Tombstone or the, uh, the Scorpion or Kingpin. Any of the bad guys. I mean, what's there to say? They're just good, strong. They're so strong. They're all very powerful. Very beefy. Yeah, they're good bad guys. So the Kingpin, I, it, that the design of the Kingpin may be one of the things that, uh, it takes me back to reading comics when I was younger and I never liked characters that were designed in that way. Again, works for the movie. There's no other way to do it. It's perfect. But it it reminds me of like Todd McFarlane comic books. And he did a good run of Spider-Man. And he's a big part of why Spider-Man is cool at all. Like in terms of posing Spider-Man, Todd McFarlane, big part of that. But he does this weird thing where he does these big boxy characters with little heads and these big like thug kind of mafia-ish Guys, I do like that they're pulling from that comic book language for Kingpin. And uh, it's it's just interesting because he's so massive. And especially seeing it on the big screen, he's so brutish and strong. Is it possible that they're like riffing on that to an absurd degree on purpose? Yeah. Because I don't really have familiarity with the designs that you're talking about, but it is funny how far they pushed that aesthetic yeah. on yeah, it's, him. It's almost like distracting because it's so different than like... 
that kingpin doesn't exist in the world of Jefferson, Miles' dad. Like, there's no way those characters could go into the same coffee shop. Yeah. Right? And this is like getting into technical talk, but something I discovered today from some unknown film source where the directors were talking about the movie uh, was that the rig for Kingpin is basically just like a giant black void with like <laughs> his headpiece is attached and there's like basically sliders to push it around anywhere on the body that it needs to be to make sense for the camera angle. And I was like, that's genius. Like, it's so funny, but he was just like so wildly cartoonish that like, it's not a body really right. under there. It's just like a big black void with a head zone yeah. stapled to it. It's great for visual contrast. I mean, he becomes so imposing at the end when he's kind of pounding on Miles. Like, Miles looks so pathetic. It it works for that scene. But in terms of, you know, this movie wants to make you feel... I don't know if it actually does, really. Maybe it does. It, it wants to make you feel bad that his plight is that he's trying to save his wife and kid and he's just going about it the wrong way. But he doesn't really feel like he's part of that family because he's so cartoonish, which could just be strategic. Like, don't connect us. Don't let us connect to this character too much. Let him just be a, a one-off villain for this first movie. Yeah, I think some of it is that because mm -hmm. his, at least for me, his story didn't strike me that emotionally. No, like if anything else, you, you want his family to go away. Right, like you're like, exactly. you did the right thing by leaving. And uh, I think it's really cool that in the flashback that you see where originally he's like wailing on Spider-Man, just beating the crap out of him and his wife and child come home and they see him in action and they're like, holy shit, we got to go. Your dad is losing it yeah. and they leave and then they die tragically in a car accident. Uh, and then at the end in the climax, he's in this subway train floating through the cosmic void and they intersect with the collider beam. And so all of the universe is aligned and the exact same situation plays out where he's beating the hell out of Spider-Man and his wife and child show up and see him do it and they bail and they're not even in the same dimension, mm -hmm. but it's like, this guy is a fuck up no matter what, because yeah. he's just, tragically villained villainized i don't know like but he's just like he's just doing the exact same thing he's never gonna get him back i think it's like what really drives that home mm -hmm. and i think that's good like and so at no point do i really feel like this movie is trying to get you to feel that sympathetic because he's so transparently doing the thing that lost him his family in the first place and yeah, it's just like, nothing. until you change who you are it's not gonna work mm -hmm. let alone the fact that they are deceased and you can't have them but i thought that was cool yeah the revival i mean it's never good to bring people back from the dead i mean pet cemetery you know taught us that god tales all this time oh that little kid Ugh. <laughs> yeah I, I don't want to i don't i don't like kingpin that's the point obviously i do like uh i think doc ock is pretty cool she rules. I love She's the, awesome. The reinvention of the way her tentacles work, the way they're kind of uh like uh cyborgy intestinal shapes. It's, yeah, it's like they're like pneumatic and like air filled or whatever. Yeah. They puff up when they're like gripping stuff or whatever. That's cool. Yeah. It's, it's just unexpected. Mm -hmm. I th and I th they wink at you so much throughout the movie about who it is. Right. Like <laughs> I just think that's really well done. Also, Catherine Hahn is the voice. Yeah. And who, honestly, I'm not that familiar with like a lot of her roles, but she's great in the stuff that I've seen her in. And she's a perfect voice for this where she's just kind of like smarmy, mm -hmm. but like really smart. You can tell that she's like really on it, but she's just like sassy in exactly the right way. It yeah. just feels good. I don't, I just, I don't have a lot of familiarity with iterations of Doc Ock, but it felt like a fresh take. To me. Yeah, he's usually more overblown. He's more of a classic mad scientist. Spider-Man 2, the Sam Raimi one, does it well. He's he's wild, but he really uh but he can be toned down and he's very passionate and he loves his wife. So you you are really sad when he dies. So that it's like the better version of Kingpin if you want to create a sympathetic villain. But um, I like this version because yeah, like you were saying, she she seems to be just a true kind of a cold-blooded academic. Like, she's not one-dimensional. Like, she, she is smart, and you should be concerned at how smart she is. <laughs> yeah, she's, like, a little creepy. Yeah. Like, when she's telling Peter B. Parker that he's going to disintegrate from being in this dimension, and she's like, I can't wait to see that. Yeah, she is And you're creepy. like, oh, God. Oh, hello. Okay. 
weird. But like, yeah, there's more to her mm-hmm. than meets the eye. And also, so and I mentioned in the, they keep winking at you about who it is. The first time she shows up in that movie is in Miles' science class. She's the like physicist in the video giving a lecture. It's really funny because he's standing in front of the projector or whatever, and you can see Dr. Olivia, and then the last name is cut off, so you can't know. But, it, it, like, your intro to this person is like, oh, she's the type of person who makes videos that kids watch in school, which also, too, kind of makes you feel like she must be okay, that she's involved in educational media yeah. to, you know, to even just, like, teens, it make it just sets up this context of like a normal person in the world who's like probably pretty nice. Well, that's the, <laughs> and then it takes his pivot. Part of the Doc Ock story is he is Peter's friend before he you know loses it. So that's part of the tragedy of, and that's why they're always he's one of like the main Spider-Man villains because they began he began as kind of a mentor. So it's almost maybe they're kind of hinting at that a little bit by putting her in the classroom possibly. Um, because it is a big part of like that character, the Doc Doc. I guess we kind of, there's a lot of the back half we haven't really gotten into a ton. Maybe like the resolution. I do have, Yeah. well, I don't know if I have a lot to say about it, but the, the entire climax of this movie is next level. Yeah. It took me to places I didn't know I could go, sir. Okay. I don't know who I'm, I guess I'm talking to all of the directors when I say that, but like, I always thought the aesthetic of the collider was very cool. Because the first time you see it is really early in the movie. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, the beams go off. And I was like, oh, my God, that's so cool. Like, it looks awesome. It's so colorful. And it feels so loud mm-hmm. and real. Yeah. And I intense. love that. Mm-hmm. And then by the time you get to it in the end, it's just like you're, like, living in this cosmic void of color. And the colors are changing. And they, a- like, act really beautifully with the characters. Like, by the time that this whole sequence is over and it's just Miles on his own, all of the background colors have, you know, are just Miles' colors. Yeah. And I think that kicks ass and is really cool. Like, they just do so much wild stuff that I remember sitting in the theater watching this and just being like, I just can't believe it. Like, I just don't believe what is happening. And I love it so much. Is there... Am I wrong in thinking there's a part where the accelerator is creating, like, a big black void? It turns black at some point, doesn't it? Yeah, that's like right at the end when he's fighting Kingpin. It's like there, it's red in the background, but all of the material is black. I just like that as maybe a callback to just working with ink, which is, I, I don't know how much, I guess we haven't really ever talked about this, but like how much time you spent with traditional media in any of your work. But there was like, you know, a long run of 10 years where I was just using black ink and just the true joy of working with ink is pretty magical. And I don't know, to me, there was something being evoked in that, just this big black blotch on the screen and the sort of comic bookness of it. Uh, You're a hundred percent not wrong because uh, I heard this, they mentioned this many, many times in the commentary that these specific black dots that you're talking about in this, and they show up a lot in other spots of the movie, Mm -hmm. all to do with the collider and the dimension stuff. They call them Kirby dots because it's how Jack Kirby represents like cosmic energy and space, which is totally true. It looks really similar. And I thought that was funny. They use the term Kirby dots like 70 times. (laughs) But that, yeah, it's exactly what they were trying to evoke, which I think is cool. Yeah. And it's it's like just something that, you know, this is the, the type of comic book shit that you connect with because you're you're looking at these mass produced things. But what you're seeing is somebody's hand gesture on paper. And you really are connecting it to the Jack Kirbyness, which I guess is to tie it all back to the beginning a little bit, is part of my resentment of the Stan Lee-ness of it all, is that guy never drew any of this stuff. Yeah. He he did writing and he conducted everything. And there's a lot to be said for people that conduct and stand up for ideas and people and, you know, also strip people of power and agency in the work that they're making. But to me, comics are about the hands that drew them in a lot of ways. Cause that's truly how you like connect and remember so much of these images. And a lot of the design in this that we didn't even really get to is they're evoking line art so often with like the, the features of the face. If we get a close up of miles, we see his eyebrows and like the wrinkles are line, which is, you know, clearly like trying to tie this to just the technical craft of drawing shit. <laughs> 
Yeah, and they do it so beautifully. I love all of those details. And like I mentioned earlier, sometimes they have the hand-drawn, like, like there's the really little things even. When you first see Kingpin, he's clicking a pen, and there's yeah. little, like, lines that draw around the action. And it's just that kind of stuff really takes it over the top. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the just the sort of language of comics just keeps reminding you that's where these stories come from. And that's that's the place, like, so many good stories uh, start because they're uh they just they can be really you know personal i mean with the ending it looks so cool and i love it but i'm trying to think of it's a to they the dad being there and everything it's all important and works out but it's not like as iconic as so many other parts of this movie like i'm kind of glad you said that because i think why we're sort of like running out of steam now here at this point is that the resolution is very clean and so we don't like, there's this beautiful climax, and I there is, like, a nice emotional moment where they're all going home individually, and he gives Peter Parker this, like, kind of gentle send-off with kind of, like, permission to go give it another shot, and it's very understated. So it doesn't feel, yeah, like, as iconic, but it's also this perfect resolution of the themes, yeah. and it doesn't draw attention to itself and like, in another way that I really love, because... Uh, earlier in the movie, Peter B. Parker is, you know, Miles, you're not ready for this. You know, call me when you're ready for this, basically. And uh, Miles is like, well, when am I going to know that I'm ready? And he says, well, you, you know, you're just you're not going to know. Like, you just have to go for it and, like, see what happens. Mm-hmm. It's a leap of faith. And uh, at the end of the movie, Miles knows that and has internalized this. Like, oh, I actually, like, went out and did it. And I, like, feel like I can do this now. And Peter B. Parker is just like, oh my God, you know, what if I go back to my dimension and I fuck it all up? Which you kind of get the feeling like that's why he was hesitant to go back. And that's why he was kind of OK with staying and sacrificing yeah. himself, because he's a little bit cowardly and he would almost rather die heroically sacrificing himself to save his friends than go back and like reckon with his failed marriage. Yeah. Which is great, too, because they don't spell that out for you. It's just something you can sort of gather from watching the movie. And Miles is just like, I learned something from you that I'm just going to let you know, like, you need to just try, like, just go try it and see what happens. And it's very sweet. But yeah, it's very, it just kind of happens. It's very mellow. And it's nice. I like it a lot. Yeah, it's a different type of heroic gesture, right? It's like, okay, we can punch and fight and shoot webs and do all this cool, colorful stuff. But yeah, you're right. The, The kind of true resolution of this movie is Peter or the true resolution of the movie is miles, like giving Peter permission and the confidence to at least go back through the portal and, and like return to his world. Cause that's, he's just so hesitant and it's, it's truly sad. Like it is understated. And a big thing about this movie is that it's from the kid's point of view. And it's not all about this sad sack which is something we run into with some of the movies we've talked about is like the (laughs) sad adultness of it all. (laughs) But this, this movie like reminds you that, Oh, like sometimes grownups need a little bit of advice and encouragement. And it's just, it's giving everybody a little agency and giving everybody a little power in a way that I think is very real. It's like kids can say insightful, encouraging stuff. It doesn't always have to come from the adult. And I just think that's like a perfect little message for the end of a movie that's kind of unexpected, really. Like, that's not what you thought you were getting at the end of this adventure. Yeah. I mean, just have a genuine connection as people. There's even like the explicit sort of like the mentorship slash like temp surrogate dad role that Peter B. Parker has. But it's like not about that at the end. Like they both have things to share with each other. Oh, such a good movie. Um... And there's one, there is one final scene that I think we should talk about. I don't think there's much to say about it because it's just a universal good. (laughs) And that's like the what's up danger montage where he kind of comes into his own and it's really fucking dope and it's like super cool and everybody likes it. But before I'm doing this a lot where I'm like leading up to that cool scene (laughs) that I want to talk about. Well, I was actually reminded of this by what you just said and like the scene right before the scene where he goes and like he crafts his like custom Miles Morales suit and he like has this whole badass music sequence thing that's so awesome. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, it's like when he's like tied up in his dorm and his dad comes to tell him they, I, he wants to tell him that his uncle died, which yeah. he doesn't know that Miles knows already. And he doesn't quite say that, but he's like, he's clearly devastated by the loss of his brother, who you know from you know context that they clearly were close at some point. Something went wrong. They've always had this weird distance. Now he's dead. You know, the dad's just been traumatized. And it's re- making him realize something about his relationship to his son and maybe how to not have that happen. Mm-hmm. Like he can see the seeds of the division happening and he's like, actually, maybe what I need to do is see Miles for who he is and let him be. And like, maybe then we can have a relationship that doesn't turn out like me and my brothers, which again, I say all, which is like, none of this is fucking spelled out. Oh, it's so juicy. It's so good. And I love that there are all of these callbacks that don't feel obvious or distracting in the moment because at the beginning of the movie, when the dad drops Miles off at school, he's like, you have to say I love you back. And he like, you know, kind of hazes him in front of the school in a very dad-like way. And it's funny and Miles is embarrassed and he has to say, I love you, dad. And in this one, it's like, this is just a genuine moment where a parent and child are connecting. And he's like, I love you. And you don't have to say it back, which Miles can't say it back because he's bound and gagged in the other room. (laughs) But it's just like the dad is like, I'm reaching out for you. I love you. And I'm not making it about how you feel about me. Mm -hmm. I'm not asking anything of you, which is something that parents do also that definitely pushes away kids. It's like asking them to be a specific way or think a specific way. And it's like you can't. In a lot of ways, I think you have to meet them where they're at and just try to teach them stuff, you know, as it comes up and as is appropriate. You can't force them into any one way or another. So all of that is just like a very rich scene. And it's nice in this movie to constantly see kids and adults all sort of interacting and on the same emotional, not like level, but they're all, they're all in the same. Ra- yeah. Right? Like there's yeah. no, like the kids in the movie are too dumb to kind of understand this or whatever. Like they're just relating as people. And mm-hmm. the only real difference maybe is like experience in the world and they're obviously not equivalent but it's i don't know you could probably tell from the history of this podcast at this point i'm just like i'm a real sucker for like families and people like genuinely relating and hearing each other like that's very nice but that's just a great moment and it's nice that you see his relationship with his uncle and his relationship with his dad and like peter b parker and all of them kind of respecting each other (laughs) except maybe aaron and the dad I, you don't really see them interact, but there's obviously like an issue there. And that's not a whole thing, but mm-hmm. it's just nice. Yeah. That's that deeper backstory that we just don't quite have the time for this. Like you're saying, it's sort of just like at the, fr- at the fringes of this movie is this sort of like more weighty kind of sadness or, or like bit history and like trouble within the family, which is all real. I mean, like, if these characters felt like they just began their lives when the movie started, that that would take a lot away from this. So there, there should be these questions about who these people are. Like, those are the good questions you should have at the end of a story. Yeah, it gives it some genuine texture, I would say. Makes, and makes you want to watch another one. Which I gladly will. October 7th, I think, 2022. Yeah. But before we get into that really quickly, do you have anything to say about this cool scene? I don't know. It's fine if you don't. I feel like there it's so iconic. The um the what's up danger scene where he like spray paints his suit and he like jumps off a building. Oh, uh I don't know. It's hard to go back to that after like I felt like we said some nice things about like the Peter B. Parker moment and stuff. I, I love that scene. I don't think I have anything particular to say about it. I also don't have the movie open. So maybe if I was looking at it, I'd be like, oh, hell yeah. Yeah, I don't think even that I don't think would help because like a big part of that is like it's basically like a little music video. Yeah, you know, it's great. And it even has like a little cut in between where it like repeats some of the dad's like, you know, you have this like spark of greatness. Like, and I just like want to see you like push it as far as you can. That kind of deal. Mm-hmm. Um. But I kind of agree. Like, I just felt like we need to acknowledge this scene because it is so wonderful and really powerful. But it was also extremely talked about when this movie came out. It's probably the most iconic scene in the movie. So I don't necessarily feel like we have anything to add. I just feel obligated to say that it's great 
and it's I really cr- like it. it yeah, <laughs> I, I suppose what makes it stand out, and it, it's not video gamey in an annoying way. It's video gamey in that it uh, you really feel like you're in his point of view for some of those shots, like when mm-hmm. he's dropping down off the building and you're seeing like right from his eyes. It's really the only time you get right up in there with him. Which is yeah. another part of the joy of Spider-Man is like the freedom to be above the city. Because right at the top of the, when we got into the movie, I was trying to, you know, I was pointing out the New Yorkiness of it. And part of the New York thing that maybe this movie doesn't like enforce enough is it can be fucking hard to get around, especially if you're a kid. It can take a <laughs> yeah. long time to go anywhere. And it there's a really lot of people does. between you and that space. So being able to be above it all, which is probably like another Spider-Man phrase that we've seen in one of these movies, is it's just so important to like the qualities of this character. And it's it's perfect to end the movie reminding you that. It's like, here's why you want to be Spider-Man. <laughs> yeah, it's that like pure joy of just reveling in the concept mm-hmm. that I love that they gave a shout out to. And I think the only capstone comment I have for that which I thought was neat, but there's that like iconic shot where he's falling down the building, but the shot is reversed. Yeah. So he's actually moving up. And uh, what I think is cool is that was like called out in like the stage directions in like the first draft yeah. of the script ever. And it was like the only thing that just remained the entire time. And I think that's pretty cool. Like they nailed it first try, mm-hmm. you know, apparently I don't have a lot of experience with writing scripts or stage directions, but apparently like it's pretty rare for them for things to just survive the entire, like the whole process. Yeah. So it's cool that it was just like, that's such a legendary moment that it just lived the entire time and made it into the movie. Yeah. It's one of those things that spurs on and motivates like the whole project, like the urge to just like capture this magic and then the and then the fun is like putting it in the context of a a bigger story and i guess you know cartooning and animation all this stuff goes back to just playing with physics like trying to simulate and like stretch and bend a reality so like of course those that sort of shot like reverse the reversing like the physics of the world for a moment is like something you're going to want to do with a project like this yeah We love cartoons. <laughs> yeah, particularly this one. I think it's, uh, did you say it was your favorite? No, I actually don't care for it. <laughs> yeah, that's what it's... <laughs> <laughs> So that's all for now. Please join us next week as we dive into Don Bluth's Rosebush of The Secret of Nim. Rats. Rats. So finally, we're going to talk about something I like. It's a bad time. (laughs) Okay, you can check out our uh, episode archive and other tidbits about Caitlin and I and stuff. (laughs) Etc. Find this stuff at cartoonfeelings.com. Tweet at us or join us on Instagram. Both are at feelingcartoons. Uh, If you have thoughts or questions that you'd like to share with us, we'd love to hear them. So please email us at cartoonfeelingspodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to know what's up. If you have any podcast uh, episode suggestions, angry comments about sassy things that we've said, etc. Yeah, let's let's talk off the off the show, please. Off the record. (laughs) Off the record. All right. (laughs) That's all for now, folks. We'll see you next time.